loud. And we are live. Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Sarah Schlota, and I'm here today interviewing Warwick Schiller. Uh, and I'm so, so tickled pink that we have this opportunity today because we have been talking back and forth for how long now, Warwick, about being able to do this? Uh, Feels like it's been over a year. It's, it's, it's been a while, but I gotta, I gotta say right off the bat, I'm so excited. I feel like I'm meeting Brene Brown. Oh my God. <laughs> So that's really kind. I don't see myself as being of that caliber, but I really appreciate oh, that. I believe you are, but you know, like at horse expos, I'll be at a horse expo and people will come up to the booth and they kind of get fangirly and gushy. And yeah, 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 yeah. Like, oh, did you, you know, like they feel like they know me. Yeah. And my wife finds it weird. And then she yeah. listens to Brene Brown a lot. And one day she was walk, you know, going for a walk with the dogs, had the earphones and listened to Brene Brown. And all of a sudden she thought, I think she's my friend. Like, I feel like she's my friend. And yeah. I, support, I would have to tell her. Yeah. And she's like, well, that's, that's what we get at the, at the horse expo, you know. That's, that's anyway, it, I yeah. Feel a bit that way. I kind of feel a bit that way talking to you. I really appreciate that, Warwick. I, it's been funny because I, uh, when you get to know somebody through the virtual world and you get to hear what they have to say, and, and if it starts to resonate, and you and I have had some sort of private messages back and forth about some of your process that we're gonna talk about today. And, um, and I think that has allowed us to get to know each other without even actually having a chance to ever talk directly before. So there's a sense of pre-existing familiarity that makes it kind of exciting. Um, so. Yeah, and you've, been, you've probably been exposed to some of my uh, things that trigger me online. So <laughs> that's, you know. I have. <laughs> you know, yeah. So I'll own it. Yeah. You know what? We, that's all we can do, right? And that's what we're here to talk about is how we have these very human responses and those responses affect relationships both with other people and with horses. And how do we work on working through these pieces? I mean, this, this is a very, very human or mammalian conversation to have. So, um, and I think this is one of the reasons why I've been so keen on having this conversation today, perhaps the first of, of many, um, where we talk about um, exactly this human element in the in horse welfare horse training um, that often doesn't get spoken about that I think you have been very um, open and visible and willing to be vulnerable about as you have been engaging in your own personal process and um, learning different things and challenging your views and you know doing your personal work and adjusting how you work with horses as a result I think um, it's been very courageous of you to do so in such a public way. And so I'm really grateful um, for your willingness to do this today with me. You know, it's funny. I, I have people tell me that all the time. Yeah. Oh, I'm so brave putting it out there. But I'm, I'm not really doing anything different than I've always done. Yeah. I've always put out there what I know. Yeah. I just know different stuff now. Yeah, that's right. I mean, so it's not like, it's not like, oh, I'm going to stop hiding what I do and how I do. I mean, I've, you know, my videos have always been very authentic. It's not like, okay, we do this one thing off camera and something on camera. It's all been yeah. warts and all sort of thing. And then as my warts all changed, um, you know, I put them out there. But yeah, I've, I've never once thought, okay, I'm going to start telling the truth. Yeah. It's just my truth is a bit it's of a shifting. different truth than it used to be. So it's, yeah, so it's, thank you for thinking I'm courageous putting it out there, but I, it, 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 it hasn't been a like, oh, should I or shouldn't I tell mm. them stuff. It's just like, I've, it's the same as I've always been. It's just, I've had a fair bit of growth in the last, I think I have, might have had like Peter Pan syndrome for a long time to where I, you know, wasn't any different from 20 to 50. Yeah. And then there's been this huge change. So, you know, I was, I was being very honest about who I was before and, I guess now I'm being honest about who I am now. Yeah. And I think, I think what I mean also by the courageousness is perhaps you don't see it. Perhaps it's kind of like you responding to me earlier where I don't see it, but I appreciate you telling me, you know, is um, this piece around being willing to show the changes um, because in the horsemanship world, and I think in the, in any kind of guru culture world where there's a lot of gurus on pedestals that, you know, pr proclaim to have the way or the only way or whatever, there is a, there can be a reluctance to uh, acknowledge change or acknowledge um, shifts in, in perspective. 
um, lest they they be seen as you know not as credible or not as all knowing and and so I think I'm also speaking to that part is that perhaps you've always been like that and you're now also more willing to um, add some pieces in that traditionally are not really brought in from the perspective that you tend to come from and I think that's been really cool to see. Yeah I think that's probably the only difference because mm -hmm. what I was doing before was as I learned a new technique yeah of the same mindset I was on but a new technique I didn't go I'm not going to tell anybody that one. I'm going to go, Hey, and I'd say, who told me, like, I was talking to this guy the other day and he told me this. Right. And I think it's better than what I used to do. So now I'm doing that. So it was yeah. just that. Yeah. And I think a lot of train, a lot of, I don't like the guru thing, but a lot of mm -hmm. people in the public eye do that as they go along. I just don't think any of them have the 180 degree shift. Yeah. To make it that obvious. I think they all do it. I think anybody who's at the top of their game is at the top of their game because they are always looking at new ways of doing things, but usually they're the, a new way of doing things through the same lens. Yeah, that, that's it. That's it. Just take one pair of glasses off and have them replaced with another one. So that's, you know, so I, yeah, I, I, I really think that's it. I think most people who are at the top of their game got there because they, they drew information from as many different sources they could find. And, and, you know, I know for a long time, I kept looking for more information, but the information I was looking for all had the same lens as the old information I had. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, I think that's and, how it goes. And I think that happens more regularly than you realize, because I mean, like you and I talk about sometimes this, these camps, you know, in horsemanship perspectives, like the, the, the negative reinforcement folks and the positive reinforcement folks and how there's all these slings and arrows being thrown at each other. And, and it's, it's the constant looking for information from within one's own lens that can create these problems. And I think where I got really inspired from you was a couple, was it one or two years ago work that we both did that same course online, working with fear and horses through the International Association of animal behavior consultants. When were we both in that program? Was that two years oh, ago? Oh, that's been uh, probably a year and a half ago. A year and a half ago or so, something yeah. like that. Um, and, and I remember thinking, wow, that is really, really amazing that to see, um, because one of the things that comes from sort of the more shall we say, natural horsemanship, traditional horsemanship kind of lens. Now, I know you and I both use that term because we're trying to toss that term out the window, but you know, coming from sort of that tradition, perhaps on some level, I haven't seen too many trainers who have originally come from there be willing to adopt the more science-y sort of learning theory. Let's look at you know, the order of things and it's not that doing it it's wrong it's when it's when you do it, you know, and that there's, um, there's other pieces that can be helpful rather than being the one trick pony that I think I had written about in one of my blog posts that you really like. Great blog post. Great. Yeah, thank you. It's really long. It's a heck of a, it's a heck of a tome. <laughs> right, because it's, it's detailed. It, you, you're not left with any questions at the end of it. But speaking about the science part of it, mm -hmm. so you and I arrive at science from completely two different ends. And how yeah. I arrived at science was, I mean, you started with the science. Um, how I arrived at the science, like doing clinics, I'd be explaining what I'm doing and how I'm doing yeah. it, why I'm doing it, how I do it yeah. differently, how I arrived at this point. Mm -hmm. And I would have people at watching clinics who are somewhere in the mental health game of some sort. They might be social workers, they might be psychiatrists, might be psychologists, they might be um, psych nurses, all sorts of things. And they go, oh, what you were doing then? That's called titration. That's right. That's called... Um, um, I've forgotten the word for it. Something approximation. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The um, the small, the, the little approximations towards the goal that you're aiming for. Like, oh, we call that success. In in you're doing exactly what we're taught to do in psych, you know, in a psych degree. That's right. called successive approximation. Yeah. And and I'm like, oh, is it? I thought it was horse training. And yeah, and yeah. so I've learned, I've kind of learned the science of why it works. Mm -hmm. But I've learned it. I've learned the, the stuff empirically. That's right. And it's always interesting when the science comes along and kind of explains to me why it works. And mm -hmm. so then I start trying to quote the science, not because I'm a scientist, but I'm trying to find another way to explain to people why mm -hmm. this works or, or whatever. I had an interesting, had an interesting um, experience in Canada a few years ago. I was up there yeah. doing some work. And there was a lady at, uh, there was a lady, at, I did two clinics back to back. And there was a lady that sat in the front row Mm -hmm. every day really excited to look you know she's probably 
65, um, curly, grey hair. And um, my son was with me. And on the, the night of the third day of the clinic, at dinner, Tyler said to me, he goes, that lady's been sitting in the front row. She's got a question for you. She, she wanted to know if she could ask me a question. Mm -hmm. Sure. So the next day I'm out there with my microphone on doing things. And I walk over to the front row and I'm like, do you have a question for me? And she goes, like that. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's not a, that's not a public, she's got a question, but it's not it's a like public a private question. question. It's a private yeah. question. Yeah. And so at lunchtime, I made sure I went over and sat off on my own. And she came over and sat down next to me. And I said, so, so you have a question? She goes, no, no, not really. I don't have a question. I just want to tell you how much I'm enjoying this and it's going on for a while. And so I said, so what do you do with your horse? She goes, oh, I don't own a horse. I've never, never ridden a horse. She's been sitting here. It's now three and a half days of me just blah, 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 blah. And she's been sitting there like that. And I'm like, what are you doing here? She goes, well, I'm a, and she's in some sort of mental health business, but she lectures on it. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And she said, she saw a video I did on YouTube uh, about the five love languages, the book, the five love languages. And I was relating it to horse training. She goes, that made so much sense. And I started talking to people about, what you said about the horses to help them understand the concept and so she said i'm here to learn see some things that happen that i can use in my teaching as an analogy and i said well we do exactly the opposite i learn some of this mental health stuff to use as an analogy to help people with their horses and you're watching what i do to do it back the other way so yeah. that's kind of how i've arrived at most of the science and it's funny that the direction i'm going in you know this whole connection thing and I knew it was working. It was amazing why it was working, but I didn't know why. Yeah. And now it's like, you up. <laughs> it's like, you showed up with your polyvagal theory. I'll get a question about polyvagal theory. Hey, we can talk about that for sure. But before we go into your questions about theory, <laughs> well, um, we, can, I, can, I, can I ask my question? Cause it's not oh, really about it. Really okay. Crazy. I was going to say, if it's a theory question, about ever, polyvagal theory, we'll back it up. Yeah. Do you ever go talk ahead. to Peter Levine? Uh, I've actually done a master class with him in person and brought a demo client to California from Canada to um, go on stage and present the case to him. So I have met him in person and done some work with him in person. Okay, so the next time you see him, can you tell him Warwick Schiller wants you to train it to polyvagal ultimatum? It's not a theory, is it? Why, why is it called a theory? Because it's still being uh, developed and honed and there are aspects of it that are um, conjecture. It's not like a hard science. It's a map. And even Peter Levine will say, the map may not be the, the whole terrain, but it sure helps us to get around. And so, yes. Yeah, it's still yeah. sure helping me get around, so yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, and so it's just so funny because here you are looking at this idea of connection first before getting into technique and how the connection is so important before we try to do anything else. And, and here I am in this little psychotherapist in Canada you know, who's got all these ideas and, and here we are having this cool conversation today. So I think this is really brilliant um, to have this talk. And so perhaps work what we could do um, before we get into what is polyvagal theory and because I'm sure people watching this are going, what the heck are they talking about? Uh, maybe we could back it up a little bit and talk about um, uh, maybe just uh, if there was a personal thing that was happening in your life that you realized, you know, was unresolved for you that was impacting how you were with the horses. Because this is one of the big pieces that really prompted me to want to chat with you today as, as an example. Because uh, I had recently done some podcasts, one of them was with Horse Chats in Australia and looking at uh, a therapist's lens on horse training and um, therapist-assisted horsemanship or trauma-informed horsemanship, as it were. And this idea of the unresolved issues in the human, whether that's emotion dysregulation or attachment, relational issues, whatever, show up in trainers. And because trainers are not like therapists in that they're not asked to go do their own personal therapy to address their issues before becoming horse trainers. Most of us therapists ha are expected to do so, so that we can hold a cleaner space for the work that's needing to happen. But because most horse trainers probably don't have that same stipulation, like there's no overarching body that says thou shalt do this. Um, often a lot of trainers don't recognize what we call those reenactments that play out where the trainer is coming from their internal reactions, their traumas, their mental health stuff. They're putting that on the horse. They're putting that on the student. And then the student and the horse are feeding off of the trainer's dysregulation or the trainer's unresolved issues, but getting blamed for their reactions. And it becomes this real reenactive mess 
And I'm curious if there was a story maybe around that that you could share, that you'd be willing to share um, around that, where maybe if there was something that you realized was influencing your work that you have since come to address and is no longer influencing it in the same way. Um, well, I think, oh, let's go back to the, talking about the trainers. You know, for me, mm -hmm. I was clueless to what, I was clueless to the issues I had for a long time. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's, and it's not, it's not, I don't have a problem. It's, I don't know I have a problem. It's not yeah. like someone trying to say you've got a problem. And I'm, oh, I don't know what that problem. But yeah. for me, once again, <laughs> it came from the horses. So, the yeah. whole thing that led me down this garden path was about five years ago, my wife bought a, a horse. So I used to compete, train and compete in an event called reining. Yeah. And my wife bought a new reining horse. And we bought him off a friend of mine who trains in Texas. And he's a very good trainer. He's one of the best, probably the top 10 in the world. And I know how he trains. Okay. And this horse, um, he said, oh, I have a trouble getting him shown. The term getting him shown means going in the show ring and getting through the whole thing mm -hmm. and having it work. Mm -hmm. Okay because he spooks at the judge's chair. So this friend of mine that, that trains, he doesn't tr do any horsemanship -y stuff, okay? If there's an issue, he just kind of covers it up and he's an amazing trainer at what he does. And so I knew there was a lot of virgin territory left on this horse, like he would never have addressed that. Mm -hmm. And if I can, I can fix that easy, you know? Right. At, at the time I was doing clinics all around the world, presenting at horse expos around the world, my YouTube channel was going well. So I'm on top of the world. I'm starting to believe my own BS sort of thing, you know? And I can fix that horse. I can fix anything. <laughs> You've got the, hu own. the hubris of being on top of your game. And yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> well, what I thought was on top of my game. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is in my, and it wasn't like I was on top of my game as in I'm the best in the world or any no. silly thing like that. It was like, I'm, I'm, I'm getting it done. This is working. Yeah. Um, anyway, we've got the horse home and I could not change anything about him. He was functionally, I mean, the, the spooking, yeah, I'll get rid of that. That's, that's not a big deal. But I got, you know, there were things that were going on with him that they couldn't fix that. That was easy. But this horse was just like no emotion, like no lights are on, no one's home. Yeah. And I dealt with horses that are shut down to a point before. And I, I'd had quite, quite good success with them. This one, I, there was nothing I could do to make this horse any better. Mm -hmm. So I didn't spend very long working with him. I stopped trying to make him any different. My wife was still competing on him because he was functional because we no longer have the spooking at the judges chair stuff. But I realized there was a part of this horse that I didn't know how to get to. I didn't know how to change. And so I'm not going to try to stick a square peg in a round hole, but he kind of opened me up to maybe looking outside the lens I was looking at because the lens I was looking at, you know, like I said before, everything I learned, was more of the same lens. I wanted to, I was going to get to the top of that heap. Mm. And I knew that wasn't helping him at all. And so it just opened me up to look at, look at different things. And I read an article one time, I forget what it was that resonated with me, like, and probably the, um, the turning point for me realizing there was more out there than what I knew was I, I was doing a clinic in Texas and a girl came to the Texas clinic with a Mustang. And he was nine years old. He's been out of the wild for six years and he's been under saddle for about, about six years. Mm -hmm. And he has a random bolting issue. So bolting horses is dangerous. That's something you want to fix. Okay. Mm -hmm. People can get killed with bolting horses. So, but, and usually it's relatively easy to solve if you can backtrack to what causes it and solve that issue. I never, you know, you don't have to fix the bolt or the buck or the rear. You just have to backtrack to figure out what's the cause of it. And, but this one's random. She says, it's not a certain thing. It's, I cannot, I cannot say it's one thing that makes it happen. It's just out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't figure, figure it out. So it was a three day clinic. And the first day we did some traditional groundwork, horseman chippy groundwork, like I was doing at the time. The second day she came in and I have, um, I have 12 people in my clinics and I used to do 12 people all day. Then I used to do six people for half a day. And now I do three people for two hours, but this was the six people half a day. So there's six horses in the arena and she's in the morning group. 
the second day of the clinic and she was asking a horse to disengage, which is just walk down beside him and ask him to untrack his hind feet. And when a horse untracks their hind feet and steps their inside hind foot in front of their outside hind foot, they have to kind of turn loose inside a little bit mm -hmm. to do that. And she was working on that. And then she said, oh, I've got a question. He's blocking me out. And so when she goes to walk from the front of him around the side of him, he turns his head and blocks her. Mm -hmm. Now in the past, if I had done that, when they turned their head, I'd probably just reach under their jaw with my hand and just move it over. So now I'm on that side of their body without me moving my feet. Mm -hmm. okay? Now I'm on this side of your body. There's, there's no repercussion or anything, but it would be more like if I move my feet around their head, I lose. I was in that mindset. At that the time. mentality. Yeah. I'm not mm -hmm. going to lose, but I'm also not going to have a fight about it. I'm not going to, there's no repercussion, but I'm going to just put my hand over them. Just move your head over. And now I'm in your, now I'm on that side of you. Yep. And then I would go ahead. But for some reason, I said, I said, let me have the lead right for a second. And I went to walk down that side and he turned his head. And when he did, I stopped and I stepped back yeah. in front of him, in front of his body, not his head. His head's turned to the side now. And I just stood there until his head turned back to the front. And I saw some indication of him letting go of whatever it was. Mm -hmm. He might have started blinking. Maybe his ears moved a little bit. One of those things. I don't even know what it was at the time. It may have been licking and chewing, but it probably wasn't that big of a letdown. It was just a slight change for the better. Yeah. Then I tried it again. He blocked me out. I stepped back. And this went on for about 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. I, had no, I said to everybody, I don't know what I'm doing, but I've got a hunch. Yeah. So then after about 10 minutes, I walked down that side and he, leaves me, he lets me walk down the side of him. Yeah. I haven't corrected anything. I haven't done anything to him. I walked down to his shoulder and I'm thinking, okay, what else can I do? He's been ridden for six years. So surely you can touch him without it being a problem. So I reached my hand out and went to sit on his neck. And as I did, his head raised up about that much. Yeah. And I stopped and stepped back yeah. and said, I saw that. Yeah. And I waited till he showed me some sign of, so yeah. and then I, then I, did that, got that bit good. Then I went back around to the front. I could walk from the front to the side. He doesn't block me out. I can touch him on the neck. He doesn't, he's not, doesn't raise his head up or stop blinking or whatever. Okay. Let's see how this disengages. Disengage was perfect. But I thought, but he didn't want her to disengage him. So maybe that triggers it. So I'll go back to the front and see if he lets me back around. He did. It worked perfectly. I didn't do anything. And I said, I have no idea what I just did, but he seems fine with it now. And I handed the lead right back to him. I said, just hang on to me for a sec. Oh, she said, what do you want me to do? And I said, just hang on to him, hang out with him for a minute. About 10 minutes later, I was working with someone else and I hear this collective <gasps> from everybody in the, at, the, at the clinic. And I turn and look, and this horse is buckled at the knees and dropped down to his belly and he's snoring dust clouds in the sand. Mm -hmm. And then he has a roll, gets up, shakes himself, buckles at the knees and boom, down he goes again. And I said to her, his name was Hannah and his name was Cody. I said to Hannah, does he ever do that? She goes, I've seen him lay down once in nine years. And he was way out in the pasture. And when I showed up, he jumped up. But I've, I never see this horse lay down. I'm like, well, that's interesting. And he slept till lunchtime. He probably slept for about an hour and a half with other horses riding around him. And we actually had to wake him up for lunchtime. So the next day she came back in and she said, what do you want me to do? And I said, I would just hang on to him and see what happens. And she stood there for 15 minutes. He boom down, went to sleep and slept for four hours to lunchtime with the microphone, other horses riding past him. He didn't, he didn't budge. And so I knew something happened then. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what it was. I had no idea what it was. And, but I knew I didn't teach him anything. Yeah. And it was the first time for me I've got to change out of a horse that I didn't, I'm not going to say facilitate because I facilitated this one, but I didn't ask for it. This was not training. No. And so right then I had no idea of what you can achieve by not training, but I know I, I saw something. Yeah. And so when I came home, I looked up research on horses sleeping habits and I learned that I knew they could sleep standing up. I learned that they can only doze standing up and to get that deep REM sleep, they need to lay down for about 30 minutes a day. And if they don't, we can't ask horses what it does to them, but we know in humans that if they don't get enough REM sleep, they can become irritable or anxious. Mm -hmm. um, and so I knew that was a huge change, but I, I saw 
Cody and Hannah last year, which was two years after the incident. Yes, yeah, two years after the incident, and he has not bolted since. Mm -hmm. From that, that one thing I did, and what I realise now, it was, I won't blow the surprise and go into the polybagel thing, <laughs> but what I realise now, it was connection. Okay, it was it was listening. It was telling him, I'm aware of your concern. Yes. Yes. And for me, these days, that's probably the biggest part of the whole connection thing is being able to read those little things they're concerned and letting them know that I see their concern. Okay, so that was the whole whole thing. I'm not sure that answered your question. It, um, yeah, it kind of it kind of it kind of does. I'll just I'll just before I hop in, I'll I'll let you finish because it sounded like you're about to continue saying something. Um, but what? But the whole the thing about your I think the question was, what was it about me, mm. or my lens or whatever? So mm. I didn't realize it, but this, not the Mustang. Mustang was after after that, um, but I didn't realize it that. Until I got this horse that was completely shut down, he, he made me aware that I was shut down, that I didn't, I didn't know that I was basically uh, stuck in freeze mode. I've never had access to fight or flight mode. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. That's not been my go-to. And... Yeah, so he, I mean, I can talk a lot more about that when we go along with it, but, but just, yeah, he, he made me, so it took a shutdown. So I came at this the same way I come to the science, yeah. you know, from the horses, but he, yeah, it took a shutdown horse for me to realise that, that I was very shut down. Uh -huh. And that, and, you know, learning that look, had me look into, well, how, did, how did I get this way? Because as far as I know, I had the perfect childhood, lived on 1200 acres, so you know, five miles out of town, I come home on the school bus, get off the bus, ride my horse around 1,200 acres. Mum and dad were home every night. There was no drinking, no fighting, no arguing. You know, I was like, I, I had the perfect childhood. There's, there's no reason for me to have any issues, is there? Hmm. And so, yeah, so he helped me realise how shut down I actually was. Yeah. It's often, it's often the things that we don't think about as having had the hugest impact. You know, we often look at all the other things while well, my needs were met and we had a decent lifestyle and, you know, mom and dad were present in the home and there wasn't alcohol, but, but those shutdown experiences can happen as a result of other bits. And it's usually about misattunement and attachment shock or moments of disconnect or the messages that we've been given about emotion and how emotions are supposed to be dealt with and, you know, and modeling and it can be intergenerational. And so so how, well, thank you for sharing that story. I was, I was curious if it would come back around to, and what was the piece for that in you? And I think that that's really brilliant because how many horse trainers are actually quite shut down and disconnected from their emotions and have learned to go into, well, fix the problem mode. Let's fix the problem. Let's fix the problem. Let's do some sort of magical technique to make the situation better. When in reality, all that's needed is attunement and to set the conditions for something different to emerge and this is what I know you had learned in the IAABC course a couple of years ago that you and I took around. It's not always about the techniques. How can we arrange the antecedents? How can we set the conditions? Because if we set the right conditions and address the issue earlier on in that sequence, we might not even need to resort to technique because there won't be any issue to resolve. And so well, often... Yeah, that's where it's going now is I've, yeah. always, been, I've always been solving the cause of the problem yeah. Not the problem. I've never addressed the problem. Like, you know, mm -hmm. on my, my big business is I have an online video training thing. When I was training horses for the public, people would bring in problem horses and I would video the first day, the second day, the third day, video the whole process. And I'd have rearing horses and bucking horses and bolting horses. And nowhere in the process did you get to see rearing, bucking, bolting because I'd go back to what I thought was the cause of that. Yeah. But now I'm more aware of the causes of the things I... Where I thought was a starting point is not a starting point. It's another symptom of an even earlier cause. You got it. And you, you don't, and if, and you know that you don't know that, you know. No, and this is the thing. In somatic experiencing, we call that prodromal work. Prodromal in medicine language is the thing that happens before the thing. 
right? And so if you back it up and back it up and back it up, like what is the thing that shows up before the thing? And sometimes we back it up. So you're pretty good at backing it up. And then you realize that this experience. What's that word? Pro what? The prodromo, P-R-O, P-R-O-M-A-L. Well, and there's most, a small tip saying that says, so what happened before what happened happened? That's, that's exactly first, it. So, that's so that would be, for. yeah, and that would be the pre-prodromal is what we call it in somatic experiencing. So it's not just the prodromal, but it's the pre-prodromal, right? What happened before the thing that happened? Well, that's Let what I was going to ask Anna with the Mustang. Yeah. So what is the one thing that tends to happen before we bolt? She goes, could be, there, there was no, there was no thing before the thing. Mm -hmm. So it's random. And what I realize now, what the thing before the thing, the pro, the pre-program pro pro was, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> the pre prodromal Yeah, it's a tough expression. <laughs> but but yeah, yeah, you're exactly right. And this is what I think is so fascinating when a horse owner says, well, I actually don't know what the thing was. And, and, and who knows? I mean, I wasn't there and I don't know her and I don't know her horse. Um, but I always get curious about, well, what is missing from the equation that we're not noticing? And in this particular case, what you fell upon was the misattunement. And if a horse has a particular experience of being misattuned to, as in, um, to use Dr. Daniel Siegel's language, um, being seen and heard, feeling felt and getting gotten, right? And those are some of the conditions for safe haven in a secure attachment relationship. If those conditions aren't there, you know, then what we start to see are these behavior problems. And then it's like, well, what's, what's the cause? Well, it, it might not be that there's a rustling of a branch or it's a noise of a car or a particular piece of equipment or a dog that ran by. It can be a relational preprodromal, right? So I don't know about what her attunement is with her horse or what that kind of experience is like, but if that horse is used to trying to communicate a cue and the, the humans around that horse continue to just do things and disregard the horse's cue, horses just learn to shut down or to, you know, be aggressive or have some sort of response to not being heard. And so you did something really simple, which was setting the relational conditions by prop offering attunement. Right. And in offering it to me. And so I recently wrote a blog post about um, a connection before concepts, three uh, comparison of three methods Loved of it. pressure release. Loved yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, and that's where I talk about the only real method of pressure release that is um, not about asking the horse to do something such as accept an object that it's afraid of or move away from, you know, move away from a boundary or back away from pressure, et cetera. The only one that's, that's not about that is the first one, which is the one you stumbled upon, which is the first indication that we notice something's not going right. The first, that earliest prodromal in the sequence, it, and we pause there and back off or, or do our little rock step and kind of wait for a moment and go, okay, let's pause there. And so the horse goes, oh, you saw me. You saw my discomfort. Whew, I can actually rest with you now. I feel safer with you now because you're actually listening to me and I can tell because you stopped and gave me time. Right. And that's the, that's the, the secret sauce right there. That's, that's, that's exactly it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And no one talks about that. Like, I, you know, I learned that technique. Gosh, I learned that technique about nine or 10 years ago around the whole stopping when you notice the no as opposed to don't only stop if you get the thing you want. And I'm like, nah, I didn't learn what, from that one. I learned, I learned stop when you notice a sign of hesitation or no or activation. But that, that's because my original training was in the equine assisted therapy world. So I'm not coming at it from a horse training perspective. I came in it from a relational on the ground, what happens as you approach a horse and can you both be in this relationship together kind of perspective, which you know, I like that we're bringing this over into the horse training world because I think it's this missing piece, really. It's, it's the missing piece, but the yeah. thing is, if 10 years ago, five years ago, mm. I had met you and you said, oh, no, no, there's a, there's a step before that. You should do this. I would have said, what would you know? You're not a horse trainer. How many horses have you trained? Like, I know. Show me. Like, show me your results. How does this work for you? Totally. And what I feel, I will get into this later, but what I feel yeah. is interesting now is I have, I've basically developed some street cred mm. in the horse world. Yeah. And so I think, and this is not about me, but I think I'm the, I'm, I'm the person to bring this to the masses because they might actually listen to me. You know what I mean? A, a, as a equine assisted therapist trying to tell the horse world they're doing it wrong, they're like, yeah. 
Yeah, but you just lead people around on horses or something. Else. I'm a horse trainer. I've got to get some stuff to happen. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and that's what's so interesting about that is, is this is why I was so excited to do this, this interview this week is that while um, I have come at this from the lens of being a psychotherapist who happens to have horses and who happens to have done this training in equine assisted, whatever you want to call it. I've also been sort of trying to bridge over into horsemanship, but not as a horsemanship trainer, because that's not my scope, but I've had to work with my own horses and figure this out for my own horses and figure out my horse training issues. And it's ironic because it was actually, um, I, I wasn't applying this even about four, four years ago. Um, I was not applying this properly. I was still listening to the horse trainers and I was deferring, you know, responsibility or knowledge to those who knew what they were doing. And I don't, who am I? I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm just a psychotherapist who happens to know about mammals, uh, you know, and of course what I have to say is not really important, you know, so I, I would dismiss my knowledge and defer to people who'd been around horses longer and who knew better than me. And at one point I had um, worked with somebody who was highly influenced by your work, uh, Warwick, and I, I had actually been exposed to your work about four years ago with the flag stuff and, um, and the, the little sort of collapsible flag thing that you use and you know that kind of thing. And so I was working with someone because my horse had a fear of objects. And this is, I learned later my horse's fear of objects was because a previous trainer had flooded him out and overwhelmed him. And then ever, ever since then, he became, fear of he became fearful of things. Um, and I kept going back to the paradigms that I was told to go back to. I kept going back to the models that I was told would fix the problem. Just do negative reinforcement. Don't let up the pressure until he gives you what you want, yada, yada, yada. Here, do the flag stuff. And in reality, I really needed to back it up one step further and go to the relationship. And it took, um, me realizing that it was my own, um, and this is where the human and the horse nervous system start to come together, because my horse wasn't getting better, because I was using all these techniques that were at the technique level and not at the relational level, and helping my horse to feel safe with me, because I was starting to get frustrated, because it had been years, like I was looking at my watch going, why, why is it, why are, we, why are we five years later, you're still afraid of these objects, it felt like the same session over and over again with him, and he wasn't progressing. And I couldn't understand it. And I kind of was getting annoyed and I would allow myself to be annoyed with my horse, which you're not supposed to do. Um, but I was really getting visibly frustrated. Once I figured out that I had to apply what I was learning in the psychotherapy world to my relationship with my horse, everything shifted. And suddenly I started using the somatic experiencing knowledge, my knowledge of attachment theory, all these bits and pieces to recognize, oh, my horse now at this point is afraid of new objects because he's also in part anticipating, I'm gonna get annoyed and angry with him whenever there's a new object. So now he's learning to anticipate something, not because of the object, but because of what I'm like when I'm trying to get him to do something. And, and so I had to back way the heck off, which meant actually ironically stopping the flag work that I was learning from your method, which is so funny to me because here we are, you know, all these years later and you and I end up in the same behavioral learning theory course on working on fear and horses. And I back, and here we are, and here we are again, you know, two years later, having this really cool conversation about how we both had missed the boat. <laughs> and we're now applying this really cool stuff and seeing some really neat changes. My horse isn't really afraid of, of objects anymore, in part because um, I have... I'm now regulate, more regulated around him. I'm not getting into the, act, the activation around my frustration. I've let go of my agenda. And I, my focus now is on our connection, my attunement to him, telling, showing him through my behavior and how I react around him that I get what he's saying to me. And I've been working with those little successive approximations and doing some of the clicker training stuff. And all of that together has completely changed my horse. And, and it's been really, really interesting to have this conversation with you because here we are both coming around full circle. <laughs> oh, I don't think it's, I don't even think it's a full circle. It's a spiral and it's going to spiral. Yeah, it just keeps it's going. Keep spiraling mm -hmm. even more. We think we're full circle now, but we're not. Um, you were just saying about your frustration level there. Yeah. If there's one good thing that can be said about being shut down, you don't have a frustration level. Yeah, but that's, that's, that's the opposite problem, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's that's still a problem. Yeah, you sure know, it is. Problem, but you don't have that, you don't get any of those fluctuations 
Yeah. And so I think I actually think being shut down was actually helpful for me training horses, training horses for the public. And I, this is where, if you think about most people who are in the public eye as horse trainers, mm. I train horses for the public. I Meaning you send me a horse, yeah. I train it to go home and it's got to operate for you as well as for me, mm -hmm. which means you've almost got to get them just to operate off cues. Okay, because you can't have them operate like these days. I really have horse. I'm, I'm really trying to get horses to operate off my energy. Mm -hmm. off my, I haven't got to the point where I can get them to do things from like a mental picture. Pe there are people who can do it. Yeah. Um, I'm starting to get to where I can get them to operate off my intentions mm -hmm. and my energy coming up and energy coming down without actually any physical thing coming outside it. But that that's a you know that's a that's a one-on-one -on -one thing. You know, if you teach a horse to operate on that and then you get given to some lady and she's petrified around the horse, you're going to send the poor horse crazy. And so I think in order for horses to be functional in the world, there, there does need to be a level of, you'll have a scientific term for it, <laughs> just being able to block stuff out and just put up with things in order for them to be, functional you know that i don't know if you've ever heard of martin you ever heard of martin black yes mm -hmm. so martin black uh teamed up with human neurosurgeon dr steve peters a few years yes. ago and wrote evidence-based horsemanship and martin, one of martin black's quotes is not in that book but martin says sometimes you can bring the horse up to the level of the human but sometimes you have to um, sometimes you can bring the human up to the level of the horse but sometimes you have to bring the horse down to the level of the human which means the horse has got he's the ultimate being and we've either got to rise to where they are, but if we can't, if the person can't do that, you've almost got to bring the horse down to, to them. And that's what I'm talking about there for sometimes for just horses to be functional. So people don't die and the horses don't get hurt. There is a level of that, you know, a, a low level shutdown um, that's almost needed for those type of horses. So let's distinguish, here's where I'm going to get nitpicky. <laughs> let's distinguish between shutdown and containment. And so, so let's maybe distinguish between the two because here's what I'm also hearing you say is that the level of shutdown that you had, he's going to take notes. Because <laughs> here's what I hear you saying, right? Is that, oh, well, being emotionally shut down was actually an advantage for me. And I've certainly heard people say that, you know, that to some degree, having a very narrow emotional range lends itself to not being so flustered by things. You know, I had the opposite. I had a much more tendency to go into hyper arousal as opposed to hypo arousal, right? I tended to have more strong emotions. I can bottle, but I tend to have bigger expression. Um, and so, but what's interesting is that neither polarization is particularly useful. Right. So while on the on the high end, which is where I tended to live in hyper arousal, my hyper arousal would create problems for the horse in terms of him learning to anticipate that I'm going to be frustrated and angry and him getting agitated based off my agitation. You know, that's its own set of problems. The sort of shut down. I don't feel things. I have no sense of emotion or conflict or whatever is on the opposite end where the tendency is to go more into fix it, fix it, fix it, fix the problem, find the solution, as opposed to the, the softer skill of, okay, where's the connection? Where's the empathy? Where are we feeling each other? And, and they're both sort of polar opposites. And we're, what we're looking to do is to find that mid range where it's not so much about hyper arousal and not so much about hypo arousal, but more about, Hey, can we be present and regulated and contained? Now contained doesn't mean um, shut down. Because often people who are shut down will assume that they're contained. And I think what they mean is compartmentalized, right? And contained means I can be present to my experience and be congruent with it and recognize what's going on for me and what's going on for the other without being reactive, as opposed to I feel nothing. Because, no. you know what I mean? And that's the distinction is if you feel nothing, then unfortunately shutting down going into shutdown or hypo arousal to feel nothing is usually a tactic that we use or we develop really, really young in order to not feel un unfortunate or painful emotions or overwhelm. And unfortunately, that process of shutting down also shuts down access to other things that are actually kind of helpful, like positive emotions and empathy and relational attunement and all these kinds of things. So if you shut down one thing, 
yeah, you're shutting down all of them, right? And so it's like, oh, so is it shutdown that we're looking for or is it more equanimity and presence and regulation in those moments? Because I've found what's helpful for me is not going from hyper arousal into a shutdown and being around my horse. It's actually finding that mid range where I can have more of that attunement, but that attunement requires me to be present to myself too. Oh yeah, no, that, I mean, what I'm looking for these days with horses is that attunement and for me, but that's a longer story. Um, but what I'm saying is horse trainers, they have to train the horse for the public to, you take this horse and go do you what, whatever you want with it and it works for them. Mm. There has to be a bit of that, but that's, see, that's the paradox of the whole thing. Us yeah. horse trainers who are supposedly know what we're talking about and we're teaching by how to do it, we're teaching them, we're teaching people like our situation is their situation. Whereas the, for the most part, people have their horses at home. They want to have a relationship with them. And us horse trainers come along and bang on about, oh, don't do that. Don't, don't spoil him, blah, 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 blah. And those people actually get brainwashed into that sort of thing. Um, and like I said, you probably can't train a horse to work for everybody without having just a little bit of being able to turn things off and put up with things. But that's not... The, the, the person who, 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 let's say my videos, for whatever, the person who's watching my video, they're not trying to have the neighborhood ride their horse. They want to be out. It's, it's a one-on-one -on -one thing. And, and it wasn't until I stopped training horses for the public and had our own horses at home here mm -hmm. that that occurred to me that I've been teaching these people for all this time like they're in my situation. Yeah. And then I realized when I got in their situation that it's like, okay. And that, that too was a, there was a lot of things that, that, um, started me down this whole path and I, if you want to know about that i can tell you about that too well i mean we may very well but before we do that i'm just I'm, I'm sitting with something you just said that i think is really crucial um i have a colleague of mine that i used to run workshops with uh caroline owen out of wavelengths yoga studio um and we used to teach about trauma-informed yoga and she comes from a tradition um from a person called desika char and i think it was desika char who said teach yoga as it as it applies to the other not to the self and so basically what that means is don't do, as you're teaching yoga, don't teach it based on how you are and how you respond to the yoga and da 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 da. Re teach it to the person who's the recipient of the, of the teaching, right? And so, and so I go, wow, that's, that's really profound. And so what I'm hearing you say is, you know, you would do what you needed to do with the horse and the horse would respond off of you. And then the horse would go to its human where it's, and this is always the problem, isn't it, with horse training, is that the, ho the trainer works with the horse and then the horse goes back to the human, but the human's unresolved issues, the human's anxieties, the human's fears, the human's patterns of relating, the human's behaviors end up creating the problem. And so unless, you know, it's kind of like, um, another comparison I like to give is um, the limited view that happens when there's a child in a family and the child is yanked off to therapy right? And the child is the, what we call the identified patient, right? Oh, the child has the problems. The child has all these symptoms and behavioral issues and so on. So let's take the child off to therapy, fix the child, bring the child back to the family, and the child has all the symptoms again, because the child is actually symptomatic of the family. And so unless you're working with the caregivers or the parents and the family system, addressing just the child is probably not going to get very far. And I think that's what you're naming is, is you would teach these horses and get them to where they needed to be. But then unless you're addressing the issues with the, the owner. Uh, no, that's not exactly what I'm saying, because okay. I think I was very good at teaching the horse to just put up with whatever they, you know, this is mm -hmm. left, this is right. Mm -hmm. okay. And so I was, without knowing it, I was shutting them down. Oh, interesting. I was, I was, okay, I, was, I see what you're I was, doing. I was okay. teaching them, like, like I was saying, in order for a horse, let's say you go to the Grand Canyon, you're going to ride a horse down. Yeah, yeah, Those yeah. horses cannot be feeling back to you all the time. Your energy cannot mean anything to them. And, and not having any energy come out of me, I had no, I had no visceral sensations. Okay, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. None. I'll tell you what, that in my journey of discovering this stuff, I realised okay. in my lifetime i've had being in love as far as sensations being in love being heartbroken fear and dread in the pit of my stomach nothing else that's it so no uh, no visceral sense like you're like your you know abdominal emotions you know what i realized was mm. 
people would say, oh, my, uh, a truck went over my dog. And I go, oh, I feel sorry for you because that's what you say. It's up here. It's a I mental response. Yeah. You I thought sorry. sorry but, but do you remember in, uh, what do you call it, in Canada, grade school? Yeah, elementary school, grade school. Elementary sure. school. Remember, the, remember the class we had on emotions where they say, now, if you're a fully functioning person, you should have this swirling of stuff down here that comes and goes and tells you how your day is going and what you feel about things. Do you remember that class? I don't even know if we had a class like that, to be honest. <laughs> we didn't. So if you're like <laughs> me and you've never can recall ever having that, you don't know it's a thing. That's exactly it. Yeah. The first time I had it, which was several years ago, I was like... There's an alien in my stomach. <laughs> I was 50 something years old at the time. Yeah. And, um, you know, the, the, the thing is, I didn't know it was missing yeah. because I've never had it. Some people that maybe have some sort of trauma and then they start to shut down like, oh, I just don't feel things like I used to. Mm -hmm. I didn't know it was a thing. Yeah. I'd never had it. Yeah. And like I said, they don't have a class at school that tells you you should have it. And if you don't have it, maybe you should look into it. Yeah. And so, you know, so I went through life not knowing anything about that. So I think my lack of emotions yeah. helped me train horses to where they would just be good for who, whoever. You know, I was very, very good at training horses. And all, I've always been on the empathetic end of the scale. I've never been fixed the problem. I've been fined. Mm -hmm. The problem is not the problem. The problem is a symptom of the problem. We've got mm -hmm. to find the cause of the problem. Mm -hmm. Um, I've always been that way, mm. um, training horses, but they still, I think looking back, they still kind of end up just doing their job without the, the back and forth, the, the, you know, they're basically yeah. not allowed to have too much input into it. Yeah. And I think that's the piece that gets missed. I think I hear what you're saying now. I, I, I was going and going down a different path with it, which also I think can happen where people train a horse and then it goes back to their human. And then we start having the problems because the human's unresolved stuff is not being addressed. And I think that can happen too. That wasn't what you were speaking about, but no, that's, I kind of went. Uh, not having emotions helped me train horses yeah. to be good for people. And, and, and to, to, be, to be push button, do the job horses. Yeah. 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 So let's get clear about that. So to be good for people as in the horse is expected to do a job and do it a particular way every time um, and not pay attention to the human's cues, which results in, and this is the difficulty, right, is um, we were just doing Equisoma training last week online and it was really cool because we were talking about the window of tolerance and we were talking about the faux window of tolerance. And I don't know if you're familiar with the faux window model. Are you familiar with the window of tolerance model? I'm sure I am, but I don't know it by that name. So. Sure. Yeah. And you know what I kind of, I kind of want to do, I kind of want to pull up a slide and do a share screen because that'll, that'll be kind of helpful for our audience. So while we're talking here, I'm just going to pull up, let's see if I can find, I think it's my day one material where we go into, we go into that a little bit more open recent day one slides. I think it's day one. Let's see. I'll teach you a little bit about the window tolerance and we'll talk about the faux window because this is where we start to see um, some difficulties. So let me see, ah, here we go. Okay, so um, here we have, I'm just gonna do a share screen. Da, 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 da. Slide time. All right, slideshow from current slide. So this is, this is Daniel Siegel's work. So um, remember what I was saying earlier about the get, you know, feeling seen and heard, feeling felt, getting gotten stuff, right? So he also coined this term called the window of tolerance back in 1999. So this idea sort of originates from him. And so what we often see is this range of tolerance. And within that range of tolerance, we fluctuate, we have stress responses, we relax, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and, you know, when we have a relatively decently regulated nervous system, because our early experiences allowed us to feel what it was like to feel emotion and then respond to that emotion and have the emotions settle, we, we get to develop a window of tolerance for our experiences. And unfortunately, that doesn't always happen a lot of the time. So often, if we have these early experiences that are not super safe, where we didn't feel safe in relationship, we didn't feel safe being ourselves, we didn't feel safe in the world, uh, what we start to see, like what I was talking about, was hyper arousal. So we're on the, on the high end of things. Like we're more in terms of, you know, that was my problem with my horse, my gelding, is he was overwhelmed and would shut down and get stoic or shut down. And I would get frustrated. So I would go into hyper arousal. 
and my gelding would go into more of a freeze type sort of shut down limited emotion arousal and we would clash and we would have these difficulties together and and both of those things are operating outside the window and what we're trying to do is is grow that window of tolerance if i if i'm gonna i'm just gonna skip through here a little bit the full window of tolerance um, is this idea that um, what can often happen is we're so used to not being in our window, right? We're so used to not even knowing what a window even feels like, is that we end up operating perpetually in hyper arousal. And then we do things to come down, but we're still hyper aroused, or we're perpetually in hypo arousal or shutdown. And then we do things to try to, you know, feel a little bit of aliveness, but we're still technically in hypo shutdown. And we think we're in our window but really we're overriding. So the faux window would be where we override. And so what often happens with horses from what I see is there's a lot of horse training, which is about getting a horse into a faux window of tolerance, which I think is where we would call bomb proof, right? Would be one example of, of what a, a, a faux window would look like where the horses just learn to tolerate and, and put up with and cope within a faux window. But when suddenly they start to wake up or start to realize they have a choice or they start to realize that they're safe or there's attunement, something starts to change, you know, and suddenly it's like this thing that's like, oh my gosh, what, what's going on here? You know, I'm, I'm no longer, you know, up here. So me, I would go into like hyper, hyper arousal. And that was sort of my classic nervous system pattern was to go up here. And then I would like do something to calm myself, but I was still hyper aroused but less so you know and i'd be like oh but i feel calmer by comparison i would but i wasn't actually truly calmer and then there's like the hypo where it's like oh i'm so shut down i don't feel anything and then i'm going to do something to feel a little bit of something but then you know i'm still technically in my hypo and i think that's what happens is if we train horses at least this is just my theory we train horses to be shut down and not pay attention to the human we've taught them to be hypo aroused we've taught them to not be connected to what's going on which has a benefit on some level like you said in trail horses that are taught to not listen to the, the human on their back because they're meant to just do a, a loop on, on this mountain trail and they're meant to just do their job and there comes a point where that has a cost oh yeah you know you've just described my whole life there so I'm just mm -hmm. <laughs> like, thinking over here thinking, oh, I was very good at teaching horses to be hypo aroused because I have spent yeah. my life hypo aroused. Yeah, and totally. It, yeah. For me, training horses, it wasn't, they weren't shut down as in they're just a try riding horse, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. They're very responsive to the things they're supposed to be responsive to. The thing that I didn't have was the energetic connection. And I think that is a huge part of the um what's that term you said before you know the community the connection part the what do you the, call uh, attunement attunement yeah attunement yes that's, that's a i'm starting to believe that's the hugest part of a horse's attunement with each other is that yeah. that exchange of energy and yeah. i had none there is no internal energy yeah and that's so right I, I kind of would teach those horses don't listen to that stuff listen yeah. to with the rain and this you know like i could teach horses to be really quite technical and looking back at them they work perfectly fine, but they're not shut down at all. Actually, recently we had a horse that I trained 10 years ago. He mm -hmm. was mine. And he's been on permanent loan as different friends of ours. He was in Alaska for a while. And he came back last year from Alaska. Yeah. And I'm thinking, his name's Albert. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, Albert's going to be a mess because I'm going to be able to see all the things I messed up with, with the way I trained him before. Yeah, yeah. Albert's a happy camper. Al I, I couldn't, I think Albert was one of the ones that, that training worked with them. They're present, they're all, you know, the, their emotional system works quite good, you know, um, and if you have ones that tend to want to be hyper aroused, you can kind of get them back down there too. But it wasn't until I got one that was hypo aroused, I couldn't get him any further down to make it better. He was already rock bottom, and, yeah. He was, he was too low. Like what he needed was to come up out of that as opposed to come down further. Like he was already, yeah. Yeah, in that lower and state. And so did I. Yeah, <laughs> exactly.
<laughs> and it's so interesting when you see a horse come out of shutdown and a human come out of shutdown into more aliveness because sometimes what can happen is um, I'm going to bring up another another slide that I think is really helpful and you're going to appreciate this one because this one's polyvagal theory I know you've just become <laughs> such a you've become such a huge fan of the polyvagal theory so let me pull up another slide I'm just going to um, get another one here that's from that was from day one I'm going to pull up something from day four's training last week um, so let me see if I can find it. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, okay. Uh, let's start with uh, let's start with uh, this one. I'm gonna share screen, share, and slideshow current. There we go. All right. So, um, so. Before maybe we go into some of this theory stuff, maybe we'll talk a little bit about like what the polyvagal theory is, just briefly, because I don't want to lose watchers or listeners, um, you know, who are not super into the science. Um, but it's this idea that we have responses in our nervous system that depend on whether or not we are in a situation where we detect a sense of safety, danger, or life threat and how our nervous system is and how our capacity for relationship is will shift depending on the perception or what Dr. Stephen Porges calls neuroception of the conditions. This is why when you're doing the work with that one horse, uh, Cody, is it Cody? Cody, it must Cody yeah. When you're doing that work with, with the horse and you're kind of you know, stepping back and pausing and taking a moment when Cody would express a response of some kind that seemed like an aversion response or a no or a painful kind of thing or an aggression. Um, that's part of the, the, the setting of the conditions in relationship, right? Is that if I feel safe with you, one of the ways I feel safe with you is I know you're listening and I know you're paying attention. And so, so when we're feeling a neuroception of safety, um, there's a number of different nervous system states that can happen there, you know, and we talk about immobilization without fear. So that's when we're able to kind of rest with each other, right? Rest and digest. And that is what you might have called, you know, that, that state earlier of REM or REM sleep that Cody never really had a chance to get. And I get curious about, you know, what kind of physiological state has he been living in where he hasn't felt like the conditions were there to allow him to let down and let go? you know, enough that he was able to sleep. And, and that tells me something very specific about his physiology, you know? And so when we are able to immobilize with fear, which is, can I sleep in your presence? Can I hang out, you know, can I rest and digest? Can I, can I actually fall asleep but not have nightmares or be up every two minutes, you know? When I'm able to immobilize without fear, which can also be cuddling, breastfeeding, you know, you know, lying in Shavasana at the end of yoga, you know, when you're just lying calmly, those would be immobilizations without fear. Those states, unfortunately, are not always without fear for many humans and also many animals. Slowing down or stopping can be connected with this other example. But when we're able to be in a sense of safety, you know, we're also able to be socially engaged, right? The, the parts of us that feel like we're able to be present are available. And you can see someone or an animal when they're engaged socially, their face lights up, right? Their eyes are present. They're not vacantly staring. You know, they've got facial tone. There's variability of expression, you know, and they're, they're able and willing to connect and engage and resonate, right? Where it's a two, it's a two directional relationship. It's not just I'm doing something to you and you're responding and doing your job. That's not wrong, but it can, that can be done in a detached kind of way or can be done in, a, in an attached or connected kind of way. Um, and within safety, when we feel safe, we can also engage in a certain amount of um, you know, sympathetic nervous system, which is the gas pedal, right? Mobilization without fear. I can mobilize without fear. I can play and run and jump and you know, do things that require a certain amount of energy without feeling afraid. I can do that in the context of relationship, which is where horsemanship becomes interesting. It's like, oh yeah, sure, I can send a horse out on, a, you know, and lunge. I can lunge a horse for, you know, 20 minutes and have it run in a circle around me, but it's this disconnected energy. I'm not in relationship. And or some horses go into flight response, which would be mobilization with fear, where it's no longer that sense of safety in connection and relationship. It's, oh boy, I am in, you know, fight or flight or, and without the safety of relationship to modulate that. Uh, and then what can happen too is if, you know, we're, we're stuck on the top end, which is immobilization with, with fear, which is that shutdown. And so what I was saying, and this is why I wanted to bring this graph in, 
was, you know, if I have learned most of my life to be shut down and not feel anything, and I don't even know that something else is possible, often um, Peter Levine talks about army medics and the expression of um, as they go in, so they come out. Yep. So if you go into the freeze response or immobilization, you know, kicking and screaming and terrified and whatever, you, you may likely come out of, you may thaw out of freeze into a similar high state of activation on your way down to feeling safe again. Like that high energy has to come down in order for us to find balance again. It's not just going to be this, you know, learn to suppress it kind of process. And so the more that we become present, the more we become connected with aliveness. And so when you said, oh, well, I just had, I had no, I was just in hyper arousal. It's like, oh, we can live up here for a very long time. And then you had this experience of starting to feel all these things inside you wake up. And, and it's not always going to be fight or flight energy. It can be other stuff too. It can be emotions we just don't allow ourselves to feel or sensations that we don't allow ourselves to feel. But it's like, oh, what was going on just before I shut all that off? And then, oh, and don't be surprised if it starts to show up as we come out and we thaw. And what's interesting with Cody is that, oh, you provided him with an experience of social connection, of mm -hmm. feeling heard. And perhaps on some level that allowed him to move from up here and, and come down, you know? So he was able to finally rest and digest out of this chronic state of what we might call in somatic experiencing a functional freeze. Right? There's a lot of people and a lot of animals walking around in a functional freeze in their full window of tolerance. Uh, what's really happening like for that. you right now, Warwick, as you're hearing me say this? Oh, it's all, yeah, it's, it's, all, it's all making a lot of sense. You know, it's funny that in, I've, I've studied your, you know, your website and read your blogs on polyvagal theory, but that one there has made a bit more sense. Mm. And while you were talking about that, I thought about, so we've got a foal and he's probably 11 months, maybe almost 12 months old now. Sure. And what I used to do with those foals when I was first born was be all over them and touch them and put my finger in their ears and their mouth and pat the bottom of their feet and all sorts of things, because that makes them good later on. Mm -hmm. And what I've realized is that's teaching them how to, to be hypo aroused from the beginning, but they seem like they're perfectly normal. Yeah. And so this fall when he was born last year, I'd come to this realization, I'm not going to do any of that. I'm not mm -hmm. going to, I'm not going to handle him at all. Yeah. I'm going to leave him unhandled. Yeah. As far as training, we would go out there and sit out in his pasture. He'd come up and sniff us, but we weren't allowed, no one's allowed to touch him. He can sniff yeah. you. Yeah. He, he, you think he's going to bite you on the hand, put it on your leg. Like, just don't do anything to him. But when they're first born, you have to do some things to him. You have to put like chlorhexidine on there their umbilical cord and stuff like that. So what I did with him, normally I'd get a hold of a foal. And when you put the chlorhexidine on the umbilical cord, you don't let go until they're not moving. What I did with him was I waited till he struggled. And when he struggled, I let him free. Yeah. yeah. And with the only reverse. Yeah, it's the reverse. With him, he is as quiet as a lamb. Mm. So engaged. You walk out in the pasture, he'll pull his head out of the feeder and come straight up to you. He hangs there. He's not pushy at all. Yeah. Okay, I can move him around with just my fingertips, but he comes up to you every time and nothing bothers him. Yeah. Things, noises don't make him jump, moving around doesn't bother him. He's just a completely different horse than I've had before at this stage because of like the ones that I would imprint before, mm -hmm. they're not necessarily going to come up and say hi or like he just loves to be around you. Yeah. They didn't necessarily love to be around you. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, but, but I, and I told people what I did with the, with the struggling, like when he, I waited till he struggled before I let go. And they're like, you're nuts. You're going to teach that horse to just panic. Yeah, and no. so, yeah, it's, it's, it's totally, yeah, it's just turned my whole world upside down, understanding some of this stuff. It's so cool that you say that. I'm so glad you shared about that. Cause what's interesting in the, the, the research about um, imprinting training, and it's kind of confusing because some studies have shown that it's actually helpful, but what the majority of studies have shown is that um, horses, we didn't talk about attachment yet today, but part of the safe haven conditions, right? It's extremely important for humans and their children and horses and their foals to be able to have that bond between mother and child or parent and child. 
um, because the more the safe haven conditions are there, where I feel safe, I know I'm attuned to, I know my caregiver is looking after me and responding to me appropriately, the more I develop properly, my brain grows properly, my nervous system learns how to grow properly because I'm not focused on survival and feeling afraid, right? I'm feeling safe. And when I feel safe, this is that power that Stephen Poor just talks about the power of feeling safe. The more I feel safe, the more my brain and my, and my social relationship skills grow properly, so to speak, optimally. And so horses that, um, even children and, and parents, when we have that safe haven experience, as children grow and develop, they go out and learn to be in the world and they go out and explore the world and then they come back to the parent as a secure base um, when they need reassurance or they need protection or they need food or whatever. Um, but the whole idea is that the more I feel safe, the more I, my brain grows properly and the more I'm able to go out in the world and explore. And what they found with humans who interfered with the horses too much in terms of the imprint training too young, where they would take the foal away from mom, mom would get distressed, you know, foal would feel distressed, hold the foal until they stop struggling, which induces hypoarousal or shutdown, right? It's released the pressure once they've shut down, which what does that reinforce, right? We just saw that foal window of tolerance. So we've got these horses who are in their foal windows. Um, and then what they found was that the, these studies discovered they looked at three months later and six months later and a lot of the horses that had a lot of the early imprint training had a lot of anxiety they didn't want to leave their mom's sides they were not so they were not social with humans they would kind of avoid humans they wouldn't go out and explore the world the way other foals would they would kind of stay close because they were anxious and unconfident and and there was one really neat study that came out of i think it was france and they were suggesting rather than um, do imprint training, which is what you've kind of discovered inadvertently, was, you know, also working with the mom. Like, can you show good attuned horse-human relationships by interacting with the mom as opposed to the foal? The foal's nervous system is always pinging off of mom's nervous system. So if you have ever had a, an anxious caregiver or a caregiver who's really uh, a lot of panic or a lot of rage, you know that your nervous system is going to grow in, in, in relation to that, right? And so we um, have this resonance. And so if I'm surrounded by dysregulated people, you know, if my caregivers are dysregulated, I'm going to feel that too and be less confident and less secure. And so the more the, whore, the more the foals were left alone, the more secure they were and more willing to approach humans independently later on. And they found not much difference in terms of the horse being willing to lift its feet or wear a halter or whatever between the imprint training groups and the non-imprint training groups, which kind of shoots holes in the theory that, well, you know, you've got to do it young or else they're going to be hard to train later. So it's really neat to hear you talk about that because you releasing the pressure when the horse expressed the no is kind of setting those early conditions for attunement. In the horse going, oh, you're not going to get me to shut down. I don't, because I, if you induce, think about it this way, it's kind of like the teenager who has had nothing but unsafe experiences, and then they're feeling really scared, and in their fear, they're very reactive, and then what do they do? They send them to a facility and tie them down, or put them in a hold, right, or put them in restraints, and what does the restraint do? The restraint sends them into a shutdown, but it doesn't necessarily fix the problem. It just teaches their nervous system to shut down. Right. It doesn't mean that they're more likely to be in connection. It just means that they've learned how to go up here. They don't have the social engagement or willingness to approach relationship, which is down here, which is kind of what you did by releasing the pressure when the horse was struggling a little bit. Well, see, I, but I think because over the, you know, over the years, I have not trained horses that are to be shut down. Yeah. Like, most people wouldn't look at a horse when I wasn't going, that one's shut down. Looking back yeah. now, I know they've, they've got a level of that. And I think... Mm -hmm. With like say with that foal chance, we named him Chance because he's a second chance to do it again, and he was born right. with a perfect white little like a cartoon speech bubble on his head. Yeah, and yeah. So that that's my that's my reminder to listen to him. Like that's he's saying something. It's my mm. reminder to listen to him. But what yeah. I didn't do was hold him until he struggled for five seconds and then let go because that's losing. That's that's teaching him to struggle. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. really think it is. If you are going to the, you know that thing you said like about those three steps for negative reinforcement, that first one, yeah, you yeah. have to have good timing. And I think you have yeah. to do it the instant it happens because yes. you don't lose, you don't, you're not That's teaching right. them, you're not asking for something and losing it. Like I, I 
I wasn't holding him tightly. I just no. had to hold him loosely. And I was waiting for him to want to go. And when he struggled, I let go. It That's wasn't right. I held on him, struggled, and then let go. Yeah. Because I, yeah. even though you will be getting the good, um, you know, mobilization without fear, all that sort of stuff, or immobilization without fear, or, you know, all the good, that stuff, you're also teaching them to struggle. I think if you let go That's as right. they struggle and there's no conflict, that's right. That's exactly you're not, it. You're not asking them to do something. You just let go as the incident happened. I think that's yes. a big distinction as far as training horses is, yeah. is um, being able to do that as it happens. It's not the getting into an argument that you lose. This, well, this is it. It's the timing. Remember in the course that we took, right? It was talking about the, the timing of the release of the pressure, so to speak. Is, is crucial, right? Because w when, when we talk about that releasing the pressure at the sign of no, it's very, very different to release the pressure at the first sign of struggle versus trying to struggle and trying to struggle and then it becomes a fight and then you release the pressure halfway along, which what does that teach the horse, right? So I agree with you 100%. The timing of that is absolutely crucial and that's where we can get confusing. You know, we can get very, very confusing. Letting them go when they struggle. It's letting no. them go. The second you notice that it's like, oh, okay, I'm going to back off for a second. All right. You know, it's, it's the, it's immediate. It's the immediacy of it. Hey, Warwick, did we lose the connection? You seem to have, you seem to have gotten lost. I'm going to see if I can pause the recording. We may need to start again because I think we've just lost your signal unless your computer died. So I'm going to stop the share here. We've got ourselves a little bit of a connection issue. I wonder if he's just going to rejoin. We will see. All right. We'll pause here for now. We'll be back. Technical issues <laughs> need to be addressed. Okay. All right. We're recording again. Works internet connection kind of failed there. <laughs> There we go. So, yeah, so I was just saying, I think it's important that when you are going to do that, it's so important that you don't create a struggle and then lose that struggle because yeah. that, I think, you know, I did a blog the other day on my Facebook group about one of the principles of training is they need to know the answer before you ask the question. Mm -hmm. But another one, a part of that is, uh, have you ever heard of Elsa Sinclair? Yeah, yeah, sure. her work is really so cool. One of, one of my favorite Elsa quotes is, good leaders only ask yes questions. And mm -hmm. so, you know, one of the principles of training is they need to know the answer before you ask the question. So you're not going to ask them something till you know they're going to do it, mm -hmm. or they know they know how to do it. But you also have to ask, I know they know how to do it, but in this situation right now, if I ask them to do it, will, am I going to be successful? And if you ask a question that gets a no answer, it yeah. kind of, it kind of, uh, from a social perspective, I think it gives it gives them the thought that you don't really read situations quite well, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's the same. That's the same thing. There is, you know, you haven't asked for something and then you've lost it. You know, you haven't tried to do something and then failed to get it done. You just didn't ask them to do something. Well, and I, I like that you said that because I think. I think of a, um, a neurobiological um, description of what Elsa likes to say there, you know, what you're talking about is asking yes questions. And, you know, if you get an answer, that's a no, what's the no saying? And I think to myself, you know, if I'm asking a question and the horse is saying, no, I go, there's something about the conditions that might not be right to allow me to have a yes. Right. And so I think to myself, okay, so if I'm asking for something and the horse is responding with a no, I go, what is its neuroception? Like, is it feeling safe? Is it feeling, you know, shut down? Is there something else going on that is impacting its ability to give me the yes? In which case, let's address that. And when the horse feels safer and the horse feels more connected and the horse is, is not so much caught up in what we might call survival physiology, where it's like, Ugh, you know, or conservation more shut down when the horse is more present, it's like, Oh, when the conditions are different, then the question might get a, the, the response we're looking for, you know, and how are we addressing those conditions to be able to get that? Yes. And if we don't get the yes, then it's not about continuing to pressure the horse until it gives you what you want. Let's work on addressing the conditions, whether that's how we asked the question or my own nervous system and what's going on for me or environmental conditions, you know, that are preventing from getting the yes that you're looking for. 
Right, and I've, I've realised that over the years, like I've never really worked on the relationship part. Yeah. But I realised I have because yeah. only asking yes questions, being aware of all the little changes, because I started to think about it recently. Why, I know horse trainers don't have any relationship with horses at all. They're mm. performing horse trainers, they train horses to do amazing things and yeah. they're quite hard on their horses. And those horses come out with a smile on their face and their ears are going like this and you're looking like, there's nothing I'd rather be doing than doing this. But there's no connection stuff. Why are they like that? Mm -hmm. Mobilization without fear. And it, I think it's because how good your timing is and how basically what the clicker trainers would call thin slicing you do your training tells your horse how aware you are all the time of the little things. And I think that gives them, I think that gives them social connection. Mm -hmm. Or at least a make, sense, or at least a sense of predictability. Like I know what to expect here, and if I know what to expect, then I feel safe, perhaps. With that too, but I think the release of an aid at exactly the right yeah. that horse sets themselves up to do something, rather than releasing when they do it, but release as they go to do it. I tell them I'm connected to you. I really, mm -hmm. I really um, think that is that is the case. Mm -hmm. And you know, the better the, the better the horse trainer the more connection they get out of that, even though they don't, they may not be working on the other social connections. Well, and that's what's so interesting about it is that there's, um, there's lots of pieces around this. And I think it's this idea of, can you do it with connection or without connection? And, and that's so fascinating to me is like, you can have someone who's very self-regulated, but not connected, right? And you can have someone who is very self-regulated and connected and, and vice versa. You know, you can, you can sort of separate these pieces apart. So it, it's entirely possible that the horse goes, oh, okay, I know what to expect here. And that there's the release and the attunement is happening in terms of the timing, right, yep. of, of, of the things. And then that's, that's helpful. That's less confusing for the horse. And because it's less confusing, I feel a little bit safer, right? So I can mobilize without fear, um, you know, and you know, there can still be something missing, which is that piece that we're talking about right now, right? And so it's not wrong to not have it, but I go, but what's, what's, what could be added in to make this even richer and even a fuller experience beyond just, uh, okay, I know what to do and when, and I know my job and, and the cues are all perfectly timed and I know what to expect and it's not confusing, you know, and there can be a certain amount of satisfaction, I think, in knowing your job and knowing what to expect, you know, because the predictability creates a sense of safety, you know, and the timing of that is, is not confusing when the timing is really good, you know, but then it's like, oh, and what's, what's that other piece and what would deepen the experience and what would make it be um, uh, even more interesting would be to add in the connection piece, you know, of what's going on, what's going on for me, what's going on in my own body, you know, and, and how do I attune on that level to the horse as opposed to it just being me showing up as, um, you know, as this, as this, this, person who has a job that I need you to do and you're going to do the job and we're going to do the job together and then that's that's that but then outside of that you know what is the quality you know and that's that's what's it's interesting to kind of explore I think yeah I mean since I've started doing some of the stuff I'm doing now what I have found is the training is so much easier anyway yeah what what are you noticing is different when you take the time to focus on the relational bits the safety and relationship stuff well, I think it takes out any of the immobilization without fear. Mm -hmm. I mean, immobilization with fear. Yeah, because right. Because a lot of times, like training horses to do technical things, the thing you are trying to get rid of is stiffness and a brace and this and that and something else. Well, I, I figured out now all that brace is lack of connection in the first place. And when you get that bit working, they're trained before you even start doing things. You don't, it's just, I used to pat myself on the back. I was good at teaching horses how to do all these things, but then I realized, or oh, solve all these problems with horses. And then I realized how I was going about things in the first place was causing those problems that I was patting myself on the back for, you know? Oh my gosh, we were talking about that this past week in the training where we create a situation in the horse without realizing that we kind of caused the issue in the first place. And then we come in and we swoop in and we fix it and we get to have that feel good feeling of, oh, look at, look at this thing that I did. I got to fix this problem, but you kind of caused it in the first place. I have so been there. <laughs> Oh, I, I think we all have. And yeah. The, yeah. I think I'm, I'm very, very lucky because it's probably been, let's say four years, but I'm going to say closer to three. Let's go yeah. with four years. Sure. That I looked at everything completely differently. 
And mm -hmm. at the time I was right. Mm -hmm. Okay. That was my truth and I was right and it worked. Yeah. yeah. So why wouldn't I be right? Right. I was sure I was right. Okay. I could get better at being right, but I was right. You know, this is this path, <laughs> this, this lens I'm looking at it through works. This is the guys I aspire to are further down this path than me. This is mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't that long ago. And I look at things completely differently. So anybody that looks at anything completely differently than I do, I find it very, very easy to not judge them. Okay. Interesting. Because, hey, <laughs> you know, it wasn't that long ago that I looked at things completely differently than I do now. And so at the time, like I said, I thought I was right. Now I understood that that was the lens I viewed everything through at the time. And so that was my truth. Now my, my lens is different, but it wasn't that long ago I had a different lens. So anybody that's got a different lens than me these days, I tend not to go, well, you're an idiot. Yeah. I, which I used to think. Yeah. Now I tend to think, okay, well, that's, that's where your life, all your life experiences have led you to that point, And that's what you know right now. Yeah. That's, that's your truth. I mean, I, I, I uh, you know, I think people, you know, this country I live in America is quite divided politically. And I think everybody's mm -hmm. opinion politically is the sum total of their experiences growing up and everything they've done. So then they're, they're not wrong. No matter how ignorant they might seem with whatever their opinion is, I, they arrived at it. You know, no one gets out of bed and looks in the mirror and goes, I'm going to try to have the stupidest thoughts that I possibly have. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. it's the same thing with horse people. I think anybody gets out of bed, looks in the mirror and goes, I'm going to go outside and screw up my horse today. Yeah. They all think I'm going to go out and do the yeah. best I can. But they just don't know any different. You know? That's, that speaks to this whole idea of trauma informed care. Or what I try to talk about as being trauma informed horsemanship, right? It's not about what's wrong with you. It's what's happened to you, you know, and then how do we create different conditions for something different to show up now? And so I'll give a great example of that politically. So I was having, a conversation with someone recently about, you know, why are, why are we having to do this pandemic and why do we have to shut down and why do we have to wear masks? And, you know, I don't care. The old people are going to die anyway. Who, you know, and they were coming from this really judgmental place, you know, and of not wanting to understand. And because I'm a therapist, I'm able to kind of recognize, okay, it's not, it's not about that surface thing. Cause this person was like, well, this is my truth. And I, this is how I believe. And you can't tell me I'm wrong. And I go, no, you're right. It sounds like there are very good reasons as to why you learn to shut down empathy in your life. You know, it's, it's not. And so for, from your standpoint, from your experiences, it would make a lot of sense if you were told what to do as a child, you were, you had very strict rules. You had to learn to follow authority and obey authority at all costs. And you weren't allowed to have an opinion you know, and you, um, you weren't allowed to have a voice and you learn to, you know, be really judgmental as a way of protecting yourself. And yeah, it makes sense that you would see the situation as a massive trigger of those earlier experiences. It doesn't mean that the perception of, well, I don't want to wear masks. That's stupid is correct, but I understand where it comes from right? It, the lack of ability to have empathy for the bigger picture that's playing out often comes from these earlier experiences. And so when we were able to kind of pinpoint in that conversation, okay, so what are the parts of you that learned to shut down a long time ago in terms of not having empathy and not caring? And as we were working together, the person was like, oh my God, like I actually, I realize now as we're walking through this process together, I actually feel afraid. I feel afraid in the midst of this pandemic. And rather than feel afraid, I'm just going to go into, I don't have any empathy. I don't feel anything. I'm going to shut down. I'm just going to become super self-sufficient and not have needs. And you can't tell me what to do. And all that stuff is super self-protective. And it feels a lot more comfortable to feel that kind of a fight or resistance or defiance or judgment towards the stupid people who are wearing the masks. And why should we have to do this? And why can't we open the stores? I want to go get my haircut crap, right? Like all that stuff for this person anyway, I can't speak to everybody on the planet, but as we started to recognize that this response that they were having to the current global conditions was actually stemming from much earlier emotional wounds. And when the person was able to dip underneath those protective responses and go, actually, I'm really terrified of dying. And rather than feel that fear of dying and fear of family dying and fear of losing more connections in their lives, they would just rather go into anger about it. It's like, okay, wow, yeah, that's your truth. It doesn't mean that objectively, you know, 
the, the decision for us to do certain things in the world to try to you know flatten the curve is the wrong decision but you are absolutely allowed to have your reaction to it but can you own your reaction right and this is where the owning of the emotion is so important and people kind of go well no it's my truth and it's like your truth comes from somewhere though right and how much is that history influencing your reaction now is that coming from you as a grown up now and your most empathetic you know wise kind self who's able to logically look at the situation or is that a knee jerk emotional reaction that comes from way earlier you know it's not wrong it's not about wrong right it's where is it coming from you know was and it, was that a client or was that just someone you were talking to that that's a that's a that's a somebody that i know that we had this conversation recently I wonder, because I had that conversation almost just three years and one week ago. So three years and one week ago, mm -hmm. I had what uh, Brene Brown describes as a nervous breakdown and her therapist describes it as a spiritual awakening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. One of those things where the earth goes whoop yep. for a bit and then straightens back up and it's not the same earth. I call yeah. it my um, sixth sense moment. It's kind of like in that movie, The Sixth Sense, when you realize, spoiler alert, have not watched the sixth sense and you're going to don't listen to this bit but if you have watched it bruce willis oh you realize that bruce willis is, is and you kind of go hang on yeah. he's dead but hang what? on but think about it five minutes ago i kind of knew he was dead but i didn't know he was dead and then, when did i figure out he was dead but you can't look at the rest of the movie the same way i had one yeah. of those things where it yeah just i realized the way i looked at the whole world was not how the world could be looked at. I'm not saying the way I look at it's yeah. right now, but it's no. different than what it was. And it's right. once and I just wondered if that person you're talking to, if that was the first time that ever went, I never thought of it that way. Because I'd never That's thought right. of anything That's like right. that way before. And if you're if you learned as a child to shut down your emotions, you're not going to know any different. So now we've got all these people on the planet who are up in arms and enraged and they're wanting to feel a sense of like agency and empowerment and this is my truth and I'm going to speak it and we lose objectivity, you know, as a result of that because in the desire to want to have a voice and feel your feelings, you're actually only connecting with a small part of the experience. You're connecting with the protective response, not the thing underneath it, but people don't see that. You know, and so they just get upset when you try to tell them the opposite and, and they just get further into their resistance. And, and it's like, well, no, you, you got to meet the resistance and recognize what that says. It says something really important. And that was super important as a survival strategy. Let's acknowledge that, you know, it's that, that is where the truth lies. It's not that it's objectively true right now, but that on some level, it makes complete sense that you'd be having this reaction. And that's true, right? And that's, and that's so interesting that you talk about like this plot twist thing with Bruce Willis is like, oh my God, here's this thing I didn't know that I didn't know, you know, and, yeah. and horse owners, I think we all want to do well. Like I think as humans, we all earnestly would like to do well, and we don't know that there's something that we're missing. And, and I think what you're perhaps connecting to also is a sense of core shame. I know Brene Brown talks a lot about um, and in terms of like, oh, there's something wrong with me and how dare I even acknowledge that maybe my perception is maybe influenced by my past because a lot of examples with trauma is that it's black and white thinking. I'm either right or I'm wrong, you know, or I'm right and you're wrong. And the only way I can survive is if I make myself right and I make you wrong because that protects me. You know, we can't, that was, that's my life story right there, you know. Uh, well, have you ever heard of a book called uh, The Masks of Masculinity? Oh, no, I don't know that one. Yeah. Really? So it's by a guy named Lewis Howes. And Lewis Howes was an All-American athlete. I think he played okay. slightly in the NFL a little bit, got hurt. Um, um, but he wrote a book, Masks of Masculinity. And he talks okay. about, I think every man should read this book, especially yeah. every male horse trainer. Um, yeah. But he talks about how when you're young, you develop these masks yeah. to cover up your fears or insecurities yeah. or whatever, because you're not supposed to show fear yeah, as a man. Yeah, yeah. Um, and what happens is you, sometimes these masks, you get so good at them, they make you famous. Yeah. You become successful yeah. because of your masks. And he That's talks right. about, and there's different masks. There's the mask of um, aggression. There's the mask, there's the know-it-all mask. There's the mask of comedy. And he yeah. talks about Robin Williams. Yeah. And everybody thought Robin Williams was having a great old time. And he says in there that the owner of the comedy store in LA where Robin Williams and a lot of others, a lot of the comedians get their start, it's so common now that if you're a professional comedian, you have severe depression, that he makes you go and see a therapist if you want to be a comedian at the comedy store. So this, mm -hmm. whole, this whole book is about the masks that we develop 
to hide from things when we're younger. And some of us yeah. get into it, we develop them so well, we get really successful. But then what you've got to do is realize the mask that made you successful and unwind that mask so you can be successful and happy. Because otherwise you'd be successful and miserable. And it's one, I have to say it's one of the most important books I've ever read. You know, every, every male friend I have, like, you've got to read this book. This yeah. book will, will make you look at things differently, especially if you're successful and not happy. Well, and see, this is, this is what we were talking about earlier. I'm just going to come back around to the slide that I had a while ago about the faux window of tolerance, right? Is, is the masks that we wear are the strategies that we use that keep us in our faux window. And it makes, we can, some of us can do a really good job of looking like we're doing okay, but deep down we're really not. Because you, and those are the people I would call the over-functioners, right? The people who are over-functioning and have, and can fool people. I mean, you, you hear people who complete suicide, who were these over-functioners and, and it baffles everybody because they didn't see it coming. You know, often we're really good at catching people when they're more shut down and having difficulty with even getting anywhere in life. But sometimes it's the over-functioners that we miss, you know, who are really struggling. And I like the book that you're telling me about. Sorry, go ahead. So I was just going to say that I think those over-functioners, they, like Rob Williams was a great example, but yeah, they, they've become successful yeah. from, it, it's kind of like, it's kind of like being an alcoholic and your job is a wine taster. It's like, uh -huh. Uh -huh. you know, it helps you. Sure. It helps you do your job better and, and you become successful. Well, see, here's the thing. So we do the things that are reinforcing, right? And so um, there's a, 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 a particular body of therapy work called parts work or ego state work. Uh, and some people call it inner child work and some people call it internal family systems. That's one particular model of ego state work or parts work. And it's this idea that we all have parts of ourselves. Um, and I'm going to actually bring up a slide. Actually, this is a different thing altogether. I'm going to see if I can find it. But I think it's a really, really fascinating um, thing to kind of consider because it speaks exactly to this idea of masks, but it goes a little bit deeper. So let me see if I can find um, the thing. IFS circle. Here we go. All right. I'm going to close that and close that and close screen sharing is stopped. Yes. Okay. Not a problem. Um, and here we go. So I'm going to screen share this instead. And I really like this model because, um, let's see if I can get rid of that and that. Go away. And that. Because I really just want to show this. And I wonder if there's a way I can make this bigger on the screen. I don't know. Mine's, it's top to bottom on mine. So. Is it? Okay. Yeah. There you go. That's probably a bit better. Okay. Um, so, so this comes from a model called internal family systems. This is not the only way of understanding this idea of parts or masks, so to speak, but it's, it's a really um, one that's become very popular in recent years. So I'm going to use the language of it. Um, and so this model, what I really like about it is that there's like this idea that we all have a core self, right? And our core self is um, Dr. Dick Schwartz is the person who created internal family systems. And so he talks about the core self as being, um, you know, described as having eight C's, right? So there's calmness, curiosity, compassion, confidence, creativity, connection or connectedness, courage and clarity. And you can tell that you're acting from your most resourced adult core self when you're able to connect with these qualities, so to speak. But like you're talking about these masks, right? The masks of masculinity. Um, it's like we often don't come from here, right? This is missing. And so in internal family systems, there are two categories of what we call protector parts. So one are managers. And so what you're talking about is like, oh, you know, the, um, the over-functioner, for instance. So that would be a manager part. So a manager part or behavior or coping strategy would be, or a mask, right, would be um, a proactive way that we live in the world. So myself, as an example, I'm a proactive sort of over-functioner. It's just how I do life until I had to learn not to do that. So I've healed a lot of that, but my base pattern has been hyperarousal over-function. Um, and so what the manager parts do is prevent us from having to feel certain things. Right. So, for instance, somebody who's known as being a control freak, that would be a manager. 
behavior, right? Robin Williams being the comic, you know, that could be considered to be a, a form of management, right? Being funny. Um, somebody who's always really self-critical or striving, right? The person who's the caretaker in all their relationships, who enters into every single relationship or friendship as the mini therapist. And what that means is that they never have to feel their own needs or their own feelings. They're just always about the other person, right? So it's just their base way of being in the world, right? And people often confuse the managers as being the self. People often over-identify with the managers as being the self because they look self-like. They look very what's the word, productive. They look very much like functioning members of society, right? The person who is the, 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 the perfectionist, you know, the perfectionist, that's a manager behavior. That's often reinforced by society, by jobs, by school, by parents, right? By coaches, <laughs> right? Coaches aim for perfection, do that thing, you know? And, and so we were reinforced into perfectionism. And so that becomes a way of being as opposed to who our true self actually is, right? we're protecting what? We're protecting against what they call the exiles. So the exiles are the feelings that were either hurt, such as the sensitive stuff like vulnerability, fear of abandonment, fear of being ridiculed, fear of being rejected, you know, um, fear of being annihilated or overwhelmed, right? Um, fear of, um, you know, whatever. There's all these different kinds of fears. It, it can also be fear of need, like unmet needs that I've learned to shut down right? So a, a, an exile might be, uh, I really want closeness and connection. And so what I do to prevent closeness and connection is I spend all my time um, overworking. I'm a workaholic. And so I'm a workaholic to prevent myself from feeling vulnerable in relationships because I'm so afraid of being hurt that I'm just going to, I'm just going to head it off at the pass and make sure I'm never in a situation where I could be hurt by being a workaholic. Right. So you can sign it, kind of see how a manager part and an exile work. Right. Managers are always protecting us from something right that we don't want to feel. And sometimes it's the feelings that we weren't allowed to feel. Right. So so a manager part can be just being really cold and and disconnected. That can be a form of management. And what I'm allowing myself to what I'm preventing myself from feeling is anger or hurt or whatever. And so the exiles are actually, you know, betrayal or anger or rage, you know, that kind of stuff that becomes a thing that is not accessible. And if, if I, by our, I, can I go ahead. Up for, yeah, over, go in ahead. The, over in the firefighters thing, you've got dissociation. Yeah. Let's talk about that. that manager thing? So, so let's talk about that. So, so this is just an example. So this is drawn by Janet Mullen. Um, a, a fair number of years ago. So this is not meant to be the be all and end all. I like to explain this, uh, you know, the way I'm going to in a second is that sometimes a firefighter shows up as a manager role, right? So just, so these, just I'm yeah. just reading into all this. I'm like, Ooh, I've got dissociation, but I think it falls under manager. And it can, right? It can. So here's, so here's the distinction. Managers and firefighters are both protective mechanisms. The main difference between a manager and a firefighter is when it shows up in the sequence. So mm. managers are proactive, firefighters are reactive. So, so if your best attempts at managing by being an overworker or whatever, or highly perfectionistic and et cetera, et cetera, highly controlling, that fails and somehow one of your feelings comes out anyway, in spite of your best efforts, right? You end up getting hurt or there's a risk of being hurt or there's a risk of connecting with an emotion that is, is dangerous because in the past you've been punished for it or what have you, then the firefighters kick in and they try to do their best job at shoving things back in the box, right? So, so dissociation is one example of that, but so are addictions, binge eating, you know, suicidal actions, you know, self-harm, violence, you know, that kind of thing. And here's what's interesting. So self-criticism, the inner critic, can show up as a firefighter. It's not just a manager, right? It depends on where it shows up in the sequence. So this is where, in like, here's what's interesting too. Although I said rage is an exile, Rage could also be a firefighter or a manager. If I'm chronically living in an angry state, right, how could that be protective? Well, I'm keeping people away. I'm so angry all the time that no one's going to want to get close to me. And so is rage an exile or is rage a way of keeping people away and protecting me from being vulnerable and hurt? In the, in the book, um, The Mask of Masculinity, he talks to an NFL linebacker who said yeah. he was you know, 10 years old, went to football practice and the, the coach said, I want you to run over that guy. And he kind of got a little teary eyed. And the guy said, don't be a little girl to those words, Yeah. run over that guy. And he said, I did. And then I ran over everything that stood in front of me for the next 30 years. 
yeah. jobs, business partners, wives, yeah. whatever. So that became his rage. That rage was his manager. Yeah. And it, that was his manager. It worked, yeah. it worked and it worked well for it. Would you say managers are the ones that it works well for? So, so managers are often the ones that are highly reinforced and um, yeah. tend to be um, approved of on some level, you know, and the firefighters tend to be the ones that are more looked down on. So for instance, I talk sometimes in my podcast with various people, I talk sometimes about the privilege of trauma coping. And you know how there's like white privilege and male privilege and female privilege and like, you know, um, cis heteronormative privilege. If you're a straight person who's into, you know, who looks like their gender, you've got privilege compared to somebody who's trans or someone who's gay or, you know, so there's all these privileges based on um, what's considered normative, right? And part of the work that we have to do as humans is recognize that privilege and not get sensitive about when we talk about our privilege, because we've all got it. Like, I've got colonial privilege. I'm a settler in Canada. You know, although I have ancestry that's indigenous way, way, way back, most of me is of European descent, um, you know, in terms of my ethnicity. I've got like, what, 2% indigenous in my background. So it's there. We've got it traced in the family tree. But it's so far back that most of me is colonial. Most of me is this white person in North America. And I don't even see my privilege because I've had it my whole life. I don't recognize what it's like to have brown skin and be stereotyped or racially profiled constantly. So I can walk down the street and not be racially profiled and not even realize it's a thing, right? That's the privilege of having our privileges, right? And so I talk about coping privilege. And what I mean by that is my particular way of coping with my childhood trauma and attachment wounds and all these kinds of things was to become an overfunctioner, right? My particular way of coping was to become, um, perhaps a little pedantic or a little uh, obsessive around detail, you know? And so if you look at um, the diagnostic criteria categories from the DSM, which is this, you know, psychiatric manual of disorders, and I'm not, I'm not a fan of disorder language because that's very much not trauma informed in my perspective. It kind of makes you feel like you're defective when in reality, you're just reacting and adjusting to your circumstances, right? So how I adjusted to my circumstances would probably be the closest category I could think of is um, one of the personality disorders, which is obsessive compulsive personality disorder, which is not OCD. So it's not the I need to wash my hands because I'm afraid of getting germs version, which would be OCD. It's the I have to do things in a very particular way. And I have very high standards and I'm very nitpicky about those standards. Um, and it shows up more in how I manage as opposed to the compulsive behaviors. I don't have the compulsive behaviors. I don't have the obsessive thoughts. I have a real strong need for things to be a particular way to feel safe. And I've learned how to not have that as much anymore. Like I've done a lot of my own healing. Um, but what's interesting is um, that would be an example of coping privilege, right? Because being OCPD or having OCPD type tendencies is really highly prized by society. You do well on the job. You, you, you do excellent on reports. I was the kid who had a triple pluses on my assignments. Like literally, I remember one assignment once where I had three pluses after it and I, I was called the brown noser in school, right? I was the teacher's pet, right? Cause I was the brainiac who always, you know, I focused all my rage and my sense of aloneness into being good at school. Cause at least I had that. And that was my over-functioning in my faux window, right? Is I did that. That would be to me a coping privilege because it's allowed me to have a career and do well in the job and, and be a super achiever. The person whose coping strategy in that moment wasn't to become OCPD or have OCPD traits, but was to turn to addictions to cope, does not have coping privilege. They're looked down on by society. They're viewed as deadbeats. They're viewed as people who are addicts and therefore are a waste of space. They're not seen in their wound. They're not seen that that was what they had to do to survive was the addiction. So you know what I mean? So I have coping privilege, which doesn't mean I haven't struggled or haven't had trauma, but how I coped, my management strategy was much more approved of by society than the firefighters that show up for a lot of people. Is it a privilege? Well, privilege, as in, I don't have to face the judgment of other people. I'm not saying privilege as in, um, I got off scot-free or I didn't struggle or I don't suffer or I don't have difficulties, but I don't have to face certain difficulties that people who also have trauma, who have other kinds of coping strategies, like the firefighters mostly, have to face. I don't have to face the judgment and the ridicule and the stigma because I'm an over-functioner. And that's, that's the privilege piece there is what I kind of speak to. The, the reason I ask that, have you ever listened to Russell or read Russell Brand's book, Recovery? No, not yet. I haven't read that. You know who Russell Brand is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know who he is, of course. 
get it, if you're going to read it, get it on audio book because it's, okay. it's Russell Brand. He's talking the whole time and he goes, I was one of the lucky ones. I was a down the gutter smackhead. And if you're a down the gutter smackhead, you either die or you figure out you've got a problem. But all these other people with food addictions and sex addictions and this, he said, you can go through life and be quite successful. But there's just something niggling at you. And he's basically saying he was yeah. lucky. His privilege yeah. was that he was a heroin addict and you either die or you sort yourself out. And so, so it, that's yeah. kind of the paradox of the privilege. The other end of the privilege scale, if you had a, you managed to have this problem that you got through life with and you think it's a privilege, but that might've been a disadvantage. If it had a, if it had a messed up your life so bad, you had to make a change. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So it's just two different ways of looking at the same thing. It's, I, it's I, privilege, I love that. Thank you for pointing that out to me. It reminds me of somebody I know who, um, in their family, they were um, the one who struggled. They were the one with the addictions and the, the eating disorders and, you know, the self-harming patterns. And, you know, the person was on disability. They couldn't work. You know, they're having all these difficulties. And this person was one of multiple siblings. And the siblings were all super high functioners, overachievers. And the one person in the family who was struggling, well, struggling, showed up in therapy, um, you, know, what, you know, who got help was the one who was really struggling and felt like the black sheep or felt like there was something wrong with them. And, and it was really interesting when I flipped it around and I said, you know, it doesn't mean that your siblings aren't struggling. It's just they're, they're, they're managing in a very different way, right? So they've all become lawyers or doctors or engineers or like politicians, you know, and they, and they look like they're functioning they look like they're doing well, but they're going to crash. Also, they're going to have a heart attack at 45, or they're going to have like, you know, hypertension, or they're going to have cancer, they're going to have some sort of something, their marriage is going to fall apart, like something's going to happen, where this facade of the managing, which makes it look like they have privilege, they have privilege in the sense of they look, they, they do well in society, and society sees them as doing well. That's what I mean by the privilege. But in reality, they're struggling, but they, they're not seen in their struggle. So they may actually be worse off, but we don't see that because they're hyper-functioning. And horses hyper-function too. And we oh, think yeah. they're doing well until they're no longer doing well. And we go, what the heck happened? Because they were over-functioning. And which horses get told to be the ones that are the bad horses? Or I learned the expression, when I went to Australia for the first time last year, I heard the expression dirty horse for the first time. And which are the dirty horses? It's the horses that have firefighter responses, right? right. That, are crib that are cribbing and wind sucking and stall weaving and that have behavioral issues that are reactive. You know, it's not the horses that are stoic and managing really well outside their window in the over-functioning range. It's the ones that are under-functioning or reactive, right? And we have the but exact same. Yeah, go for it. Go for it. Okay, so who's got the privilege? So I've yeah. been in hypo arousal. Uh -huh. You've been hyper arousal. Uh, yeah. Who's the, who's got the privilege? <laughs> Good question. Based on what? Well, I, I'm gonna. Uh, I thought you might say who's got the privilege. I'll tell you who I think's got the privilege, and it's you. Okay. And you know why? Yeah. Because I think I have to to get to where I'm going to. I have to get unstuck, and I guarantee you, when I get unstuck, I will be in hyper arousal. I think I have to go. I can't go from hype over arousal mm. to what's that thing in the middle? Yeah, the window that? of tolerance. Yeah. Window of tolerance. In order to get to the window of tolerance, and you can tell me whether you think this is wrong or not, I think I've got to come out of hype over arousal and then I will it'll all be right there in front of me and I'll be hyper aroused and I've got to get from hyper aroused to the window of tolerance. When I so I did a year of dialectical behavior therapy. Yeah. Uh, 2018, and when I first went to a therapist, a DBT therapist, I told her what I wanted to do, which was see if I can have a bit more emotions. And she said, oh, yeah, this will be fine. You know, we'll just, we also have group therapy, but you won't need to do that. And after about three months of getting nowhere, she said, you've got to come to group. You should come to group therapy too. Sure. Remember my first night in group therapy, there was a guy there and he is hyper aroused. Mm -hmm. Okay. He's very nervous. You know, he's got a tear in his eye a lot. He's a really cool guy. And I said to him, I remember watching you and he goes, why? I said, because one of these days when I get this stuff sorted, I'm going to turn into you and I want to see how you get from where you are to where you're going to go. Because there is no do not pass, go collect $200. I think I've got to go and you can tell me if I'm right or wrong. From here, I've got to get into that state to where I will be hypo aroused and then I've got to 
change that because I actually think I was born uh, probably a bit of an empath, something like that. And in 1960s, 70s Australia, that just wasn't on. Yeah. And so I think that got suppressed quite uh, firmly. Mm -hmm. So that you'd say the dorsal brakes on pretty tight. Sure. Yeah, exactly. Well done. <laughs> I know you were studying beforehand. It was so cute. Warwick sent me this video. I was studying beforehand. I've been studying trying because I wanna I wanna do a thing on polyvagal theory about horses from from where I understand it. So I've been yeah. talking about it quite a bit. But yeah, but I is that correct? In order to get to that window of tolerance and you are high so aroused, you cannot go straight there. You you've got to get the emotions and then get over them. Is that correct? Yeah, so, so let's, let's talk about that. I'm going to bring back another slide um, that I had up just a moment ago. So where was that? Day four. We were talking about this. It's too bad you couldn't join us last week. I think you would have gotten a kick out of it because it would have answered a lot of your questions. And we talked about the dials, you know, those dials you sent me. We talked all about the dials and how to make sense of the dials. And so I'm just going to come and bring this one uh, back up. Um, am I on screen share right now? Yeah, I am. Fantastic. Let me just pull this up. Current slide. Um, oh, wait a second. I've lost you. Why have I lost you? That's weird. I can still see and hear you. Hmm. I wonder why it is that I cannot have access to us as video. Well, I'll just put it up briefly and then I'll take it down again. For some reason, a setting seems to have changed. Um, but what's interesting is that, so if you... Um, have been in what we might call a functional freeze most of your life. And that's, that's that idea of I can look like I'm engaged, but I'm not present to something. Um, then it's, it's not so much that um, you, you want to go all the way into the hyper arousal in order to kind of find the mid range. We, we have to titrate into it. So it's not about like, it's about growing it by thresholds. Let's see if I can find my thresholds diagram. I wonder where I have that. Do I have that in this one? I will find out if I have it in this one. No, I have it in a different day. Let me pull that up. I'm gonna, I'm gonna end the share screen. Um, unless I can, I think I already ended the share screen. Let me pull it up and I'll, I'll explain it to you what I mean. Because I think what we're talking about right now is this idea of titration. Um, and after our call, perhaps I can send you some suggestions for people you might want to work with to explore this a little bit further, because it's not so much about just jumping into the deep end, but starting to build the capacity to be with what's under in small doses, which is that those successive approximations you talked about earlier, we're looking to do that, but with your nervous system and connecting with what's under the freeze or under the hypo arousal because you don't want to go into that completely right away because that can do the opposite which is overwhelm and we don't want to do that either we grow the window of tolerance by going through successive pendulations um mm -hmm. let me see if i can find my pendulation slides because i think that's that, the that makes sense to me because in um in therapy one day um the therapist kind of hit a nerve and i just lost it Yep. Okay. Yeah. But then every time after that, my body thought she was going to go there. Yeah. I had the biggest, the, the dorsal break was on as hard as it could go on. I actually had weird, weird sensations like, uh, like what I was looking at was like a pond and you dropped a rock in it. And there were from the, uh -huh. but it went the other way. Instead of going out, went in, but it went from my ex, you know, out here. Yeah. and rippled into the therapist's face but there was a ripple in the time space continuum it was the weirdest thing i've ever seen but that was my body going uh -uh, we are not going there it happened several times one time it went to a pin prick like i was going to pass out yeah. and the other time was that other thing but it was like my body is going e -e, not going there so it was yeah it was well, interesting. So that's what's interesting. So if, if the therapist or even the horse trainer, say, is asking something from the horse that is at a higher threshold than the capacity is available for, right? So if your therapist, for instance, asked you, hey, let's go here, and your capacity to go there is only here, there's a mismatch between the ask and the capacity, right? And so, so it's like Elsa Sinclair said, you know, ask the question so that you get a yes. And I, if you get a no, I kind of go, well, here's another lens that I have is because your, your ask is too big for the capacity of the organism in front of you. 
you know, and what we want to do is these successive approximations. So what I'm showing you here is this idea of let's be with a tiny amount of it, track the sensations until they dissipate. And what that does is that that grows your window of tolerance just a little bit more. And then when you've been able to sit through what Peter Levine calls one pendulation, and it's like, oh, and then that deactivates. And then it's like, oh, oh, okay, cool. And then I, I got through that as opposed to having to shut it down or get overwhelmed and flooded. And then it's like, oh, then maybe I can do a little bit more and a little bit more. They're like drops in the pond. So rather than throwing a big massive boulder in the pond and having these big waves, it's like, here's a little tiny, little tiny pebble and let's be with those ripples until they settle before we throw another pebble in. And so another way I, I, I example is, um, um, stimulus stacking. So I think we talked about this a little bit in the IAABC course that you and I took together, which was if you, you can stimulus stack, which is overwhelming the horse into being flooded, right? And it's the same thing with humans in therapy. If we're asking something and the stimulus creates an activation response and we don't allow that activation to come down and then we ask again or the ask is too big it just keeps stacking and stacking and stacking and we get overwhelmed and then we're, we're definitely either going to resist or avoid you know because it's too much and what we're looking to try to do this is what we teach in somatic experiencing which is why i'm like oh somatic experiencing can totally be applied to horses you know because we're looking to smallest stimulus possible allow that to rise and deactivate, settle, click and chew, okay, cool. And then, okay, then there's a little bit more space in the window of tolerance to do a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. And my thinking will be, is that therapy for you to kind of go from being in hypo arousal into having more access to feelings and aliveness is going to be in small degrees like that so you can open that window. Yeah, I mean, it sounds a lot like Horseman. And, and just to clarify, the, the, the therapist was not prodding. She, no, no, no. She asked a no, hard no, no. question. She asked a very simple no, no. question. Sure. She just didn't know that it was going to set me off. You know? But that's what I mean. Sometimes what we think is a small titrated ask is actually a massive stone in the pond, right? Because, because it's it, again, like I might ask a question and think it's a really superficial question or make a comment that's a really what I think is a relatively reasonable comment. But if the client or the horse or the, the other nervous system in front of me, that's one of their wounds, right? Think about the IFS circle again. If the, I just managed to trigger an exile by accident and then the exile, it was too quick. And we went there too quickly before building the capacity. You're going to see those managers and firefighters showed up. So that resistant you that resistant work showed up and was like no way so here is that protective response it's like oh that's really cool like where do you feel that resistance in your body let's hang out with it i don't want to push beyond that until you have had a chance to move through the pendulation before the, the capacity is built right and that's where i'm like oh that's so cool like i love that we're talking about therapy process and horse training because to me they're like you know, really good therapy looks like really good horse training when it's about connection and attunement and titration and building capacity as opposed to faux window development, right? right. That um, pendulation thing there is like my rabbit story, isn't it? Tell me about your rabbit story. And then maybe we'll wrap up on that because we've been going at it for almost two and a half hours. So, really? <laughs> yeah. Like, time off. So years ago, I was in England and doing a clinic and this girl who was watching said, well, that's well and good, but what do you do with a horse that's crazy? And I'm like, I don't know, what sort of crazy is your horse? And she goes, well, I'll go hacking out, which is trail riding in England. Yeah, yeah. I'll go hacking out, riding along, and a rabbit will run out of the wet grass, and my horse will kind of step sideways and look at it, but I'll lose, I'll lose the English accent now. Uh, step sideways and look at it, but not really do anything, and we go a bit further, and he sees another rabbit, and he does it again, and then another rabbit, and another rabbit, and I've been riding for two hours. My horse has seen 12 rabbits, none of them bothered him, and then a 13th rabbit runs out of the bushes, and he freaks out and barks me off. He's crazy. What do you do with one like that? And I said, well, I don't think he's actually crazy. What happens is the first rabbit gives him a slight fright and he doesn't let go of that fright. And so I call this stuff rabbits. And so your horse then gets two rabbits and then three rabbits and then four rabbits. And they eventually get to where your yeah. horse has a 12 rabbit limit. Yeah. And that one more rabbit caused the problem. What your horse has to be able to do is spit out his rabbit. So you're all going along and a rabbit runs out and he goes, and then he goes, it's just a <sighs> rabbit. That's exactly it. That's this, that's this diagram right here. That's, if my, the, if, rabbit, that's my rabbit story. And I love that. And it doesn't matter. You've got to, I'd say people, you've got to do it with one rabbit at a time, but eventually yes. say 10 rabbits all jumped out at the same time, you can still go, it's just, yeah. just a rabbit. And, and then at the same time, if there's 
10 rabbits that jump out at the same time, can we also have the capacity in our own nervous system? This isn't just about the horse's nervous system, but the human's, right? Is that if the human is reacting in the saddle also and starting to have an anticipatory response that the horse is feeding off of also, remember it's not just one nervous system. We keep looking at the horse as if it's the identified patient, right? Like if, if the horse also is, the human is also having a reaction and we're both getting into stimulus stacking, and we're both trying to cope and manage by being stoic and just overriding in our faux windows. And then that 10th rabbit shows up and we both kind of lose it. And it's like, okay, but it was building for some time, you know, and we were just overriding. And so can the human also start to watch for their pendulations and let go and allow that to come down the way we're talking about here? Because that's what's going to grow the window of tolerance is completing those pendulations, not continuing to stack and stack and stack. You know, and, and that means the human also being aware of what's happening for them in their own reactivity too, because often the horse is going to be responding off of the human's anticipatory stacking or charge, etc. But I love that. I love that. You got to spit out your rabbits. <laughs> That's basically the sort of nutshell right here. You got to get rid of your rabbits. Yeah. You got to get rid of your rabbits. Yeah, that's right. You got to. Yeah. A lot of people say. A lot of people say, "What do you do when your horse loses his mind on a trail ride?" Okay absolutely lose his mind and I say well how's your ground work and they go no I don't think you understood the question I'm talking about when yeah. I'm trial riding not doing ground riding so that thing on the right side of the screen that is on a trial ride when your horse loses you know something big happens yeah if they don't have any deactivation doing your groundwork doing really simple stuff you're not going to have any deactivation doing oh, yeah. when big things happen so it's I always say that's not the place where you fix anything where yeah. you fix it is before it happens you've got to teach those horses to be able to down regulate you know to return back to homeostasis before you expose them to, to, to anything really that's exactly it that's the whole value of, of somatic experiencing I, I so love this conversation work and i'm just being mindful of the fact that we've been at it for almost two and a half hours and we i am going to what's that sorry go on forever we could go on forever so here's my suggestion i have for a longest of time now i don't have my own podcast but um, I have for the longest of time had this idea of therapist assisted horsemanship and this idea of having a therapist and a horse trainer paired to have these kinds of conversations. Would you be willing to do more of these? Oh, heck yes. That's, I think that's, that's, that's the holy grail of the whole thing. You know, Please. these days, clinics, the first thing I start talking about is our judgments, our thoughts, our energies, our emotions, our negative self-talk, all of that, because I've really started to realize, like you said, there's two nervous systems going on here and, mm -hmm. I've been able to help some people, quite a yeah. few people over the years, but there's some people I couldn't help. And I'm like, I don't know why I can't help them. And I realize now is their nervous system so dysregulated that it doesn't matter what they do physically. Mm -hmm. It's what's going, it's the thing you can't see that's causing all the, all the problems. So, and so I'm no therapist, but I, some, you know, some therapists use horses to help with the therapy. Mm -hmm. I kind of use the, not the, I don't do therapy, but I, I try to use some of this sort of stuff to get people to think about that so they can, I wanna help them with their horses, but sometimes I can't mm -hmm. help them with their horses until I can help them understand some of this stuff. And how I do that is just by talking about my own experience and how things have been different for me, because what I've found over the years, and I'll wrap up real quick here, but sure. at clinic, some people, they're the problem, but you can't say you're the problem. Yeah. They wanna fix the horse. And so what I do these days is I, right at the start of the clinic, I get up, tell my whole new story about me and the therapy and what I found and blah, 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 and how it's helped. And then during the clinic, I can say, yeah, well, see, I had the same problem when I, and I, then I changed this and then, and it kind of takes off the, you're a bad person, yeah. you know, takes away from that. Just share a bit of that vulnerability, I think helps it. To, it allows me to point things out to them without them taking it defensively. Well, and this but is the whole idea of, you sharing, you're sharing your vulnerabilities allows other people to be vulnerable too, right? Like you allowing yourself to talk about your own process helps people to not feel ashamed because if we, because it's so, it's so difficult, right? I remember in the courses that we took together, we, I was talking at one point and I said, you know, because um, Robin Foster and Lauren Fraser, who were running this really cool course that we took, yeah, and they were talking about how if you're going to do equine behavior consultation or continue with the certification to become a certified equine behavior consulta consultant, um, one of the things you have to do is be really careful around, you know, wanting to engage with the horse's, the horse's owner um, because you want to get them on board, you want them to buy into what you're teaching them, but at the same time, sometimes, like you said, they're the problem, 
and like I said earlier, the horse is just the identified patient. The horse is actually symptomatic of the, the human owner, right? And what's going on in the human owner's life or what's going on at the barn and interactions between borders. Sometimes border conflict creates problems in horses. And then we wonder why the horses are problematic, having problematic behaviors because they're feeding off of the borders conflicts. And so there's all these things that can happen, but there's so much shame, right? And this is where we know trauma is in the picture, right? Is there's so much shame that to acknowledge that I have something that is causing or potentially contributing to a problem results in so much discomfort that it results in defensiveness. And you might lose people if you start to name that. And so people often go, well, I want you to fix my horse. And it's like, well, that's just like dragging the kid to a therapist, assuming that the kid is the problem. In reality, it's a bigger right. picture issue. And so I think to myself, I love how you've done that. I love how you're now sharing your story of going to therapy and dealing with your stuff and your ongoing journey in that regard. Because, hey, we're all on a journey. We're all figuring this stuff out. We're all doing our healing work. At least I, I like to hope we are. You know, we're going to evolve till the day we die if we choose to, you know. And the more we do that, that, the more we're open about our process as humans, about how we have dysregulation or attachment issues that affect our relationships or, you know, stuff that's going on in terms of how our nervous systems are because of how we were shaped, the more we can own that without shame, the better positioned we are to actually help our horses, believe it or not, or help our relationships in general. H horse behavior issues are a human mental health problem. Right? And we often don't think that. But the American Veterinary Medical Association back in 2007 created an, uh, an initiative called the One Health, One Welfare Initiative, which is that the health, and that includes the mental health of humans, animals, and the environment are all very much interconnected. And you can't look at one without looking at the other. So what that basically says is, is that if the human is doing better and healthy and, and regulated and dealing with their stuff and they're feeling better about themselves and they're more aware and attuned, the horse will also improve, right? So it's not about fixing the horse per se. Can I work on myself? And in so doing, I, I help the horse. So what you're saying right then, I'm just thinking, I was just scrolling through my phone looking for something. So from a Brene Brown book, she yeah. was talking about how she only used to help women. Yeah. And then she started thinking about men and she said, I think we've got it all wrong. If we're not doing something for men and boys, then we're doing nothing for women and girls. Yeah. That's Brene Brown. Yeah. The work the version of that is, I think if we're doing nothing for humans' mental health, we're doing nothing for horses' mental health. Exactly. October exactly. 28, 2019, I wrote that. Lovely. Like, Eureka, we've got to, you can't help the horses if you can't help the people. That's right. And this is where, and this is where Robin and, and Lauren last year were saying, well, if you're going to become a certified equine behavior consultant, which is different from a horse trainer, and we, we discussed that in the course last year, right? There's like these two professions that can help each other. Um, they both have their places. And so if you're going to become a horse trainer or a equine behavior consultant or whatever, whatever your path seems to be, it's very important to kind of not fall into the realm of therapy, of course, because that's not in the scope of practice, while at the same time, how do we start having these courageous conversations, as some people call them, around, hey, there is something else going on here. Um, I think it would be beneficial to explore some of these other pieces, you know, and perhaps when we do another call, we can talk a little bit more about what that might look like. You know, how can we start to have these kinds of conversations within the scope of practice of, say, a horse trainer or an equine behavior consultant around the human factor, right? Because it's, it's, it's human improvement or human behavior to help horse welfare and horse training. So I think that's a really helpful, helpful place we can go. So you was talking about that, and then I said, I've got a quote here, and then you just said the human factor. So on my online video library, yeah, yeah, yeah. one of the playlists is the human factor. Oh, no. Oh, that's so that's awesome. Good. That's all the human factor. Well, there we are. So thanks, everyone, all of you keeners who's, who've listened all the way through to the end. Um, stay tuned for another interview with Warwick Schiller and myself, Sarah Schlota from Equisoma. We'll have another conversation for you at some point in the near future. Thanks so much for your time. If you have any questions or curiosities, feel free to add them in the comments below. Um, if you want to add anything in, um, or feel free to email me directly, um, info at equisoma.com or warwick at warwickschiller.com. Is that correct? Fabulous. And then, because uh, sometimes what I do on videos is I turn the comments off because it can turn into a real, <laughs> a real mess of, of people attacking other people. And so if ever um, that ends up happening and we do shut down comments on the video, then um, feel free to email either of us with your question and we will see if we can put that into um, our next video conversation.
thanks so much for joining me today, Warwick. It's been a real pleasure. That was amazing. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to hit the stop record button now. If there's anything left to add, um, feel free to add it now. If not, we'll stop here and we'll reconvene. Oh, no, we, we, can, we can stop recording now if you want. Cool, sweet.